what, where are we in the Bay RMP. Um, I thought I'd give you just a quick background of where we are coming from and where we're going. So the RMP was born as an idea in 1986, and um, it by the year 2000, we had our first study of contaminants of emerging concern. So these are compounds that are not regulated and are being more and more discovered that they are a problem due to improving analytical methods. And the BRMP is leading the field in terms of studying these contaminants. Um, in 2006, there was so much interest in these contaminants that um, we actually formed the working group, the Emerging Contaminants Work Group, or ECWG, um, that this webinar is being sponsored by. And um, the uh, current tiered risk framework was developed in 2013 and was um, debuted in the Pulse of the Bay publication for that year. Um, during this time, we also had an exposure and effects work group that started in 2001 and um, kind of fizzled out, <laughs> went on hiatus in 2018. Um, and now we're in 2020, we're thinking about exposure and effects in the context of, emerge, of emerging contaminants. Um, and so instead of redoing uh, this work group that's a separate work group, we're thinking about how we can integrate these predictive toxicology techniques into our study of emerging contaminants today. Um, why, do, why are we thinking about it this way? Well, one of our core management questions is which of these contaminants of emerging concern have the potential to adversely impact the beneficial uses in San Francisco Bay? That includes whether the CEC concentrations are at levels that could be a risk for humans or wildlife, and what are the protective thresholds? Um, and these questions require a toxicological approach to at least begin to answer. Um, so this is our tiered risk framework. Right now we don't have any uh, CECs in the high concern category, which is good. Um, that would be that the bay levels were above observed uh, level levels observed to cause effects. Um, we do, however, have quite a few contaminants in the moderate concern category, which is that the levels in the bay are above protective thresholds. Um, but really, what we're thinking about today are these low concern and possible concern um, categories, because. Um, we are interested in knowing how to best allocate our resources, and uh, so we want to know whether we should continue to monitor or um, off-ramp the low concern contaminants, but then also whether the possible concern contaminants are a concern or not, and whether we should be monitoring them or not worrying about them. And so we're really, really focused on the possible concern contaminants today. Um, this is a huge category of contaminants because these are the contaminants for which there is not enough data to really be able to place it in place the contaminant in one of those other three categories. So we have information we may have information about the chemical inputs into the Bay Area, but we don't know how that um, may be affecting the ecosystem, if at all. Um, and our hope is that we can use predictive toxicology methods to understand um, everything, well, pieces of from the fate of an exposure of that chemical all the way to whether it may cause population level effects. So this is what we're really going to be talking about today is some of the methods that folks are using around North America to start to get at some of these questions. Um, so I'm back to our agenda slide. Um, our first presenter is Dan Villeneuve from the US EPA in Duluth, and he will be talking about tools to prioritize contaminants for monitoring and management. And just a quick reminder, if you have questions, email talks at sfei.org. And then we will uh, send it to Dan. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks for the invitation to present um, today. Um, so we've been working on the use of various predictive toxicology tools for the exact purpose of prioritizing contaminants for both monitoring and management. Um, this is 
in some of our work at the EPA's Office of Research and Development. So I wanted to just briefly introduce you to some of the tools that we're using and, and how we can use that to address some of the problems and challenges that are faced by monitoring programs and those affiliated with those. And um, again, it'll be a brief introduction, but hopefully it'll give you a feel for some of the tools that are out there that you might be able to apply in your program. Um, so as Ezra pointed out, um, <clears throat> There's this problem of a never increasing range of chemical contaminants that are being detected in the environment. This includes things like pharmaceuticals, personal care products, current generation pesticides, various industrial compounds, perfluorinated compounds, flame retardants, etc. And as we go through these various monitoring programs, you go out and collect some samples and analyze them for contaminants. Yeah, you know, we run into problems like this. You just detected some structure, some chemical in say 30% of your surveyed water samples and you want to get at this question, is this a concern? Is this something that warrants action or is this fairly innocuous and we don't really need to worry about it? And a common problem that we run into of course is that for many of these contaminants of emerging concern, there are no existing water quality criteria or standards to just compare the concentration and say, yeah, this is something we should worry about or this is not. And in many cases, there's actually relatively little toxicity data available in general in the peer-reviewed literature and really no authority to go out and collect those data. And a lot of that stems from sort of the traditional approach to toxicity testing, which is used basically dosing or exposing animals directly to the contaminants of interest, and then directly measuring adverse effects, whether that be impacts on survival, growth, reproduction in wildlife, or health effects in rodent models, for example, looking at the formation of tumors or various pathologies in different tissues. Um, and that identifying the concentrations at which those types of adverse effects occurred were really what drove a lot of our uh, ability to set sort of these concentrations at which we think adverse effects would occur. Problem, of course, is that this kind of testing, although effective, is time consuming, it's costly, and as a result, overall in the chemical universe of tens of thousands of chemicals that are actually out there in the environment, the fraction of chemicals whose hazards have been well characterized using these types of traditional met methods is actually pretty small. And so in response to this challenge in 2007, the National Research Council um, put forth a, a vision for toxicity testing in the 21st century that really advocated moving away from this animal testing based approach, um, specifically direct observation of adverse effects, moving toward one that was founded primarily on the use of in vitro methods and trying to use suites of predictive high throughput assays that could assess critical mechanistic endpoints that are involved in the induction or initiation of toxic effects rather than directly observing the final adverse outcome themselves. And the idea was that by using this type of approach, we could gather data on chemicals and their potential interactions with biological systems and do that in a way that's much more efficient, cost effective, and provide us with relevant hazard data on a larger inventory of chemicals. And so in response to that challenge, a number of pioneering high throughput toxicity testing programs were developed. Um, one of those is EPA's ToxCast program, which has tested uh, well over 3,000 chemicals now in somewhere around 600 different pathway-based assays, looking at the ability of chemicals to do things like bind to nuclear receptors, um, to inhibit specific enzyme activities, to interact with signal transduction pathways, or um, alter gene expression, also looking at things like impacts on cell morphology and even behavior and development in a couple of small types of test organisms like zebrafish embryos or C. elegans. <clears throat> and they can do this 
at a cost of about $20,000 a chemical to screen for a pretty wide, wide range of biological effects. That cost of about $20,000 per chemical, to put that in perspective, is less than the cost of a, a single early, fish early life stage test conducted in a typical contract lab. Um, there's also the TOX21 program, a consortium of multiple federal agencies, um, which used a smaller number of assays but has screened well over 10,000 chemicals. Um, again, looking at the ability to rapidly and cost-effectively screen chemicals for the types of biological pathways they have potential to perturb and the concentrations, the relative concentrations at which they perturb them, so their relative potencies. And all these data are publicly accessible um, through EPA's CompTAC, CompTOX chemistry dashboard. Um, you can go here to this website. You can search by chemical. You can also search by an assay or a particular gene if there's a biological activity you're interested in. And you can bring up data for these thousands of chemicals that have been tested in these various assays. So, you know, these programs have really demonstrated that this is a way to generate information on these chemicals in a very cost effective and efficient manner and disseminate that to the people that need to make decisions about these chemicals. Um, there are some limitations to this knowledge base, um, so there aren't high throughput tox data available for all chemicals yet. Again, it's you know several thousand um, currently covered. So in a in for example, some of our monitoring around Great Lakes tributaries out of 65 or so chemicals that were detected in one particular study. Um, we were able to identify traditional benchmarks for about half of those. And again, these are fairly routinely monitored chemicals. Um, but utilizing the ToxCast data, we were able to expand that to come up with some kind of hazard benchmarks for over 83% of the chemicals that were detected. And we tend to see that pretty routinely for a lot of the chemicals that are, we have analytical methods for and can monitor in environmental samples. Often, ToxCast may cover 75 to 80 percent of those, and so we can expand kind of that range over which we can come up with some kind of hazard benchmarks. Of course, the problem is in using these data is that you know, we don't regulate enzyme activities. Um, citizens don't necessarily care about receptor binding. And so in order to use these data, we ha really have to be able to understand what changes in gene expression or inhibition of an enzyme activity really means in terms of human health or ecosystem functions or services. Um, and so there's this important need for dat data translation. Right now, if you go to that Contox chemistry dashboard, you see the various assays and endpoints that are impacted. It's a little bit like going to the doctor and having some diagnostic tests run, and then the doctor just handing you the results and saying, here you go, good luck. Um, we really need somebody with that specialized knowledge to actually interpret what those results mean for our health and what changes we might want to make in response to that. And so <clears throat> we've been working on a framework called the Adverse Outcome Pathway Framework. The Adverse Outcome Pathway Framework is designed to be that translation tool to make that specialized knowledge needed to interpret these results and understand what kind of hazards these are pointing to um, to make that information available. So an adverse outcome pathway is really a conceptual framework that portrays existing knowledge concerning the linkage between some molecular initiating event, so where a chemical interacts with some molecule in the body of an organism, causes a perturbation in its biology, how that perturbation can then cascade across different levels of organization and lead to one of these adverse outcomes that we actually care about from a decision-making or risk assessment type of perspective. So really an AOP synthesizes information and evidence from relevant sources and tries to present that in a simple graphical and narrative format. And this is just an example of what an AOP looks like, per se. Um, it's often depicted graphically as sort of a, a box and arrow diagram, but it's supported by a narrative description of essentially what we know about the biology. So for example, in this case, if 
focusing on impacts on enzyme aromatase. Um, we know biologically aromatase is rate limiting for the production of 17-beta-estradiol, um, an important hormone in females. We know that in oviparous vertebrates, um, constant or the stimulation uh, or production of that hormone is necessary to stimulate the production of egg yolk precursor proteins like the telogenin. They're produced in the liver, circulate through the blood where they're taken up into developing oocytes, provide for proper oocyte growth and maturation, and provide the nutrition for the developing offspring, and so play an important role in reproduction. And so based on what we know about that normal biology alone, uh, we could infer that if we were to inhibit this enzyme or reduce the concentrations of these hormones, we could expect potential to cause um, some, pro some problems with reproduction or early life stage survival. The AOP also provides evidence that says in experiments, in studies where we've actually exposed organisms to an aromatase inhibitor, this is the exact pattern of response that we see. We see a decreased production of uh, estradiol. We see reduced production of these egg yolk precursor proteins, reduced uptake into the oocytes, and ultimately reproductive impairment. And so we lay that evidence out along with an evaluation of weight of evidence, um, and in many cases, technical review of that content, and then present that. So then you, as a decision maker, if you see a chemical that interacts with or inhibits the enzyme aromatase, instead of just wondering what that means, you can now say, okay, now I understand here's a potential reproductive toxin. And these are the species that might be susceptible to a chemical that acts along this pathway. And so an adverse outcome pathway then is really, again, an aggregation and synthesis of information. In many cases, you know, it's not rocket science. A lot of that information required to interpret those data are out there. And you know, many folks could go out and pull that information together. But this information tends to be widely dispersed and fragmented, and it takes a lot of time, effort, and energy to pull it all together. And so the role of AOP developers, and these may be a wide variety of people out in the scientific community, but my colleague Clemens Whitweer likes to say that AOP development is sort of like being a sushi, sushi chef. Um, there's this huge sea of existing information and the AOP developer goes out and extracts the relevant information from that sea of knowledge and packages up into these nice little sushi boxes that provide the information in a way that's digestible and consumable and palatable to the people that need to use that information to make decisions. And so sticking with the sushi analogy, you know, the sushi is available through um, aopwiki.org or aopkb.org. These are basically where the descriptions of these AOPs are presented online. Um, this is kind of the single online source for this information and how it's being aggregated and synthesized. And aopkb.org is really sort of the Google search engine, if you will, for identifying AOP information, identifying AOPs that might be relevant to specific keywords or biological effects that you might be interested in. <clears throat> so this is an emerging source of knowledge that you can use to interpret these new sources of predictive toxicology data, this more mechanistic type of data. And this AOP knowledge base is growing steadily. Um, over Since 2014, we now have over 200 user-defined adverse outcome pathways in the AOP wiki. It's actually approaching about 300 now. Um, because of the way they're assembled in the wiki, using a modular framework and connecting different links together, that actually represents over 9,000 unique pathways from a molecular initiating event to an adverse outcome. So this knowledge base is growing and growing steadily, um, but there are still a lot of gaps. There's still a lot of toxicological and biological space that's not covered. Um, but this is an emerging and growing source of, again, information that can help you to translate these predictive toxicology data. 
Another key limitation of the AOP knowledge base right now is that most AOPs really speak to hazard. So, you know, if you inhibit aromatase activity, for example, the AOP can tell you you're standing on a cliff. Um, there's a potential there for a reproductive hazard, but of course, you know, one of the things that you're interested in is <clears throat> sort of, you know, what is that protective threshold or how do we know when we're about to go over the cliff? Um, that's really what we're concerned about. And so more and more AOPs are trying to incorporate information on the quantitative understanding of these relationships. So what's known about how much perturbation of that molecular initiating event or these other events along the pathway are needed to actually push the system hard enough that you're going to go over the cliff. Um, <clears throat> so that's a growing aspect of the AOP knowledge base. So AOPs, um, that's all great in terms of providing us with tools that we need to interpret the kinds of data that are provided through these high throughput screening programs, but how does that relate back to environmental monitoring and how can we apply this um, to this kind of challenge? <clears throat> and so, you know, again, we often come up with sort of this laundry list of chemicals that might be detected um, in our samples. Uh, we have some fairly limited resources for ongoing monitoring and assessment. And so how do we get at this question of what are the highest priority chemicals or what, what sites are, are maybe highest priorities? What effects might we want to focus on in terms of um, biological effects-based monitoring? So. We've taken a couple approaches to get at this. Um, one is really starting from this chemical list, and <clears throat> we can take sort of a risk-based screening approach where if you have a list of chemicals and their concentrations, we can use something that's very analogous to the traditional hazard quotient approach where you look at sort of the exposure concentrations that are being detected, look to see if there's overlap with the concentration at which effects are being observed. And so trying to understand which chemicals are actually present at high enough concentrations to elicit effects. Only in this case, instead of focusing on the concentration at which an adverse effect itself was observed, we're focusing on the concentration at which one of these pathway-based biological activities measured in one of these high throughput assays is actually perturbed. And so we can calculate a simple ratio, <clears throat> um, which is pretty simple in concept to do. Um, you just need your exposure concentration, the effect concentration. Um, so pretty simple and straightforward. But if we apply this to a matrix of, say, 300 chemicals by 650 or so different assay endpoints in these high throughput screening programs, you quickly see you end up with somewhere around 195,000 calculations to do. And so we've developed computational tools that can help you to rapidly compare concentrations of chemicals with the existing ToxCast data, identify which assays are responding, um, where the concentrations that are detected in the environment are close to the concentrations that are actually eliciting effects in these different assays. And the tool developed to do that is called ToxEval. Um, it's available. It's been developed in collaboration with USGS and is available through this GitHub site. Um, it can allow you to, again, import your list of chemical concentrations, compare them directly against the tox gas data or other sources of water quality benchmark data. There's a variety of visualization tools um, that can help you to prioritize different sites, chemicals, biological effects, and look at your data in a variety of different ways. Um, so that's an emerging tool that we use quite a bit um, for this type of work. Um, one of the limitations of this approach right now in terms of these estimates is that we're relying on nominal concentrations in the well. Um, so in some cases for chemicals with certain properties, a portion of that chemical may actually be bound to, say, the plastic of the plates and unavailable to the cells. So some of these nominal concentrations may not completely represent, you know, sort of a actual environmental concentration or what's actually available to the cells or organism in the plate. So 
right now we really have to think about this as a relative value that accounts for the potency of a chemical to act on a certain pathway and its concentration, um, not necessarily as a risk uh, quotient. Um, so that's something to bear in mind, but a lot of research and thought is going into how to develop models and tools to properly account for that free fraction of chemical available in the test well and how to then back calculate to that back calculate that to an equivalent environmental concentration. The second problem that um, we face in trying to apply this approach is that real world exposures are to mixtures, um, not single chemicals. And even if we're measuring, say, tens or hundreds of chemicals in the samples that we're analyzing, in many cases, we're still only detecting a small fraction of the chemicals that actually occur in the environment. Um, we either don't have the analytical methods to detect them or their transformation products or things that we don't necessarily know to look for. And so how can we account for these unknowns or kind of this hidden portion of the iceberg of chemicals that are out there? So one of the ways that we've been doing this is basically applying the same tools that are used for high throughput screening and testing of individual chemicals, but applying those tools to environmental mixtures. So for example, we can go out and collect a water sample or maybe a sediment sample. We can extract chemicals from that sample, ending up with some unknown mixture. Maybe we do some analytical chemistry on that. We know at least part of the composition of that mixture. But we take that mixture and just test it directly in these various high throughput assays. In this case, we conducted pilot studies using the adagene battery of ToxCast assays, which looks at about 81 different features, um, largely binding to things like nuclear receptors and activation of those receptors based on the activity profile in that assay, we can then map that against relevant adverse outcome pathways to understand you know, what the potential hazards are associated with those biological activities, what taxa may actually be sensitive to chemicals that act through those pathways, and then what types of endpoints or effects we could potentially look at in organisms that occur out in that environment or organisms that we might cage out in that environment. And just to give you an example, these are actual data from a water sample from the South Platte River uh, in Colorado. So we examined or we tested that sample in the adagene bioassays. We saw six different molecular initiating events, um, pathways or targets that were impacted by this water sample. Um, we mapped that to adverse outcome pathways in the AOP knowledge base that had those particular molecular initiating events. We then filtered the knowledge base or the network of AOPs to just focus on those that directly had or were linked to these six molecular initiating events. We then went through and further filtered that based on which of these would be relevant to fish or other aquatic vertebrates. And basically, from that, we're able to identify that the contaminants present in this mixture have potential to cause embryo lethality, as well as potentially being a reproductive hazard. And by looking at these different key events along these pathways, we're able to identify some of the um, endpoints that we could measure in either field-collected organisms or, again, in organisms that would be exposed in situ to see if we see actual evidence of progression along these pathways and toward one of these adverse outcomes out in the field. We can also combine these two approaches of both kind of the direct measurement of um, the biological response to these complex mixtures um, to kind of get at this whole portion of the iceberg, compare that with what we expect to see based on those exposure to activity ratios and sort of what's the known composition and, and the response of those individual chemicals in something like ToxCast. And where those two are pretty close, um, we can come to the conclusion that 
the known composition of that mixture may account for most of the activity that we're seeing. Um, that can help us to know that we're not missing something important. Um, but if we see the case where the observed biological activity greatly exceeds what we'd predict based on the known composition, it could tell us that there's something out there that we're missing that's potentially important in driving one of these biological activities. And we can also use that comparison to identify if there might be some more complex interactions occurring. So this is just a couple examples of some predictive toxicology tools, some tools to help translate those data and how they've been applied and are being applied um, to this question of environmental monitoring and prioritization of contaminants and effects um, for subsequent monitoring. So again, there's a range of predictive toxicology tools that have immediate application to environmental monitoring challenges. Um, the science is definitely mature, but it's still evolving, and we are continuing to work on various ways to address some of the limitations I pointed out. Um, this is just a very brief introduction to a lot of these concepts and tools, um, but there is detailed training available for many of these applications, so EPA's chemistry dashboard that has all the ToxCast data, the AOP wiki and AOP knowledge base, as well as the ToxEval tool. And if you're interested, uh, we'd be happy to um, work with you further to provide that kind of training. So with that, I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dan, for a great presentation. If you have questions, please email us. Um, while we're waiting for uh, everyone on the call to email us questions, I think SFEI staff might have a couple things. Yeah, hi. Uh, this is Becky Sutton. I'm uh, the lead scientist of our Emerging Contaminants Work Group, and uh, this was a great presentation. So I'm super happy uh, to have this webinar and to learn a whole lot about a topic I don't know too much about. Uh, so, Dan, I had a couple questions for you. Uh, I guess I might start with uh, a question about other folks using these tools. I saw a great, uh, one of your citations in your slides I copied down was uh, on the Great Lakes, um, a study of identifying potential contaminants of emerging concern that would be a priority to look at in the Great Lakes. Are there other regions that are actively using these tools and, and where we might want to reach out for more uh, guidance as we start to think about using them too? Sure. Um, so the Great Lakes National Program Office has been using these tools in collaboration with EPA's Office of Research and Development. Um, we've also applied these tools in case studies out in Region 8, so in Colorado and Utah. Um, so these have been collaborative projects with EPA's Region 8 as well as the National Park Service. Um, USGS has actually done a number of these studies, and you know they have regional labs around the country. They've provided training to their staff, so USGS is actually using this quite a bit. Um, and then the Minnesota Department of Environmental Quality um, has had training on the use of the ToxEval tool, and I'm not sure all the applications that they've used it for thus far, but they certainly expressed interest in using the tool and may have some experience with it at this point. Um, so that's kind of the major efforts and users that I'm directly familiar with, but again, you know, we're providing this training for a variety of organizations, and People are starting to adopt it into how they're evaluating their monitoring data sets. All right, that's a great list. Uh, definitely more people to, to call on. I have another kind of nerdy question, uh, if no one else is here in the room. Okay, I'm going to go for it. Uh, I was curious about this whole adverse outcome pathway. Um, is there or are there adverse outcome pathways describing the neurological, neurotoxicological impacts of current use pesticides. I just thought pesticides, since we designed them to be toxic, maybe we have the AOPs worked out? Um, yes, there are AOP devel AOPs developed for a number of pesticide modes of action. So, for example, for acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, there's a number of AOPs. Um, there's several for neonicotinoids. 
Um, I wouldn't say it's comprehensive yet, but you're correct in that for many of these pesticides, we have that fundamental understanding of the biology involved, and really it's a matter of pulling that information together and then packaging it in a way that it can be um, provided through the knowledge base. And you know that's the ongoing struggle of just trying to get people that can take the time to put that kind of synthesis together and and furnish it in this sort of format. And you know, making the ties to, for example, the sources of predictive tox information. So we are working on ways so that if you go to the CompTOX chemistry dashboard, you see a particular assay response or biological activity, there would actually be a link to the AOP that would help you interpret that. Um, that's there to some extent now, but we're really trying to strengthen those connections and make those data more available. And on the AOP side, really trying to grow that knowledge base and get people to contribute their knowledge and pull that together to make this easier for folks. Yeah, Dan, this is Melissa Foley and the program manager for the RMP. Um, and just continuing on the uh, another question about the AOPs, I was curious how uncertainty is presented for those and if it's sort of a qualitative or a quantitative uncertainty. And sort of, and I guess kind of a step further of, are these AOPs being used to inform management and sort of trying to set limits for different emerging contaminants or how that kind of interaction is going as well? Yeah, I'd say by and large right now, the AOPs are largely qualitative and the evaluation of uncertainty is, is really sort of a qualitative evaluation of how much evidence and understanding we have of, of these links that connect all the way from whatever it is we're measuring as sort of our initiating event or early event in the pathway and how well we understand you know, whether that's likely to lead to this adverse effect or not. Um, as I mentioned, for most AOPs right now, there really isn't that level of quantitative understanding to know, you know how much of that inhibition of the enzyme activity or binding at the receptor or whatever is too much. Um, and there's a lot of other chemical specific factors like toxicokinetics and metabolism and availability of the chemical that also have to be factored in to that kind of question. Um, so right now I'd say it's really at that qualitative, more uh, hazard identification level. But we do try to provide an assessment of the relative uncertainty in the science and you know, how confident we are in that link between, you know, if you see this activity, you can at least know that you're standing on the cliff. Um, mm -hmm. That's kind of the, the level that we're at right now. I mean, certainly the goal is to make that more quantitative where we can, and I think that will be possible for some pathways, although not, not all pathways, just due to the complexity of the biology involved in some cases. All right, a uh, question from a listener. Are there efforts to examine use of AOPs and the ToxCast data in conjunction with computational toxicity prediction methods like from ECOSAR? Yep, absolutely. Um, so we are looking at how those various points of departure compare and also looking at things like ECOSAR, you know, for many contaminants that don't act through specific mechanisms, but rather sort of act through nonpolar narcosis, sort of interactions with membranes and proteins just in general. Um, there are ways that, you know, we've kind of looked at how well tox gas data and those predictions align. And I think, you know, I think a lot of the feeling is that for many chemicals, kind of the concentrations at which you see a big burst, like many, many pathways in ToxCast being impacted are around the same concentrations that are just causing nonspecific systemic effects on biology. And it's really, you know, one of the things we can do with the ToxCast data is evaluate whether a chemical is fairly nonspecific or whether it actually has ability to interact with very specific pathways or targets at concentrations far lower than those that may cause overt and systemic toxicity and help us sort of prioritize that.
that way as well. Um, for many chemicals that don't show this more specific kind of activity, those conventional sort of QSAR models um, are probably pretty effective estimates of their toxicity. Great. So in the interest of time, I'm going to say thank you to Dan and move on to our next presenter. If you have more questions for him, go ahead and email tox at sfei.org and we will communicate uh, for that. Um, so our next presenter is uh, Michelle Embry from the Health and Environmental Sciences Institute. And I'm going to share my screen with her now. Well, thank you, Ezra and SFEI, for the opportunity to present. Um, I'm going to be talking, I, I, my title's a little bit different than what's on the agenda, and I'm going to be talking about a project that I've worked with in my organization for the last several years on what we're calling the Envirotox database. So um, I'll go through that in a minute. But I wanted to just give you guys a little bit of background on the organization that I work for, the Health and Environmental Sciences Institute, or HESI. We're based in Washington, D.C., and we're a nonprofit. Our vision and mission are listed there. The, the big take-home message is we try to bring together scientists from industry, academia, and government to work on issues related to global health and environmental uh, concerns. And a lot of the projects that we work on are related to toxicology, exposure science, risk assessment, and we have projects related to both uh, human health assessment and environmental assessment. So the project I'm going to be talking about today, the Envirotox database and tools, falls under one of the HESI program committees on animal alternatives and environmental risk assessment. And this committee was established in 2007, really aiming at trying to address the need for alternative approaches in the ecotox space. So much of the work had been done on mammals, uh, and there was a real need to move forward and look at fish testing specifically, uh, as well as amphibian testing, and identify opportunities for reduction, refinement, and replacement. The group has, since 2007, held several international workshops um, on various topics, many of which were very much um, in line with what Dan just presented on adverse outcome pathways. And we've really served as a forum and a community of practice for people working on mechanistic toxicology and in vitro, in silico, and modifications to in vivo studies in the ecotox space. And our remit is pretty broad. We're looking at the needs in hazard and risk assessment, as well as um, in effluent assessment, which I'll touch on in a minute, um, classification and labeling and other types of regulatory needs. So we, we really try to cover the, the spectrum of issues related to alternatives. So we've had several projects since we started uh, quite a while ago now in 2007. But these uh, four here listed are the ones that are currently the areas that we're active in. And the one I'm going to be talking about today is this Envirotox and EcoTTC. But I just wanted to at least give you a snapshot of some of the other work that we're doing. And if any of these project areas are something you'd like to know more about, please do not hesitate to send me an email and I can get you more information on them. So the first one is looking at weight of evidence in acute fish toxicity assessment. It's been something that we've been working on for a while, largely related to the evaluation of the fish embryo toxicity test, and that's or the FET, the fish, the FET test, which is an OECD test guideline. But there's been a lot of discussion related to how that test specifically, and also more broadly, things like QSARs, um, the existing in vivo tests, and other types of information like algae or invertebrate tests can inform acute fish toxicity. So we actually were just, um, we're a partner on a project that's funded by CEFIC LRI, which is the European Industry Trade Association. Um, NEVA, the Norwegian Institute of Water Research, is the lead organization. The other partners are listed below. Um, and what this group is trying to do is to create um, a weight of evidence framework that can help inform acute fish toxicity assessment. And this is trying to look at the the broad spectrum of information available and use Bayesian approaches to try to try to create that. So that's just getting rolling. We're gonna have our kickoff meeting in the next few weeks. And if you'd like more information on that, um, please let me know. Another area that's sort of fresh in my mind, I was just in London week before last 
at a workshop that we held in partnership with the National Center for the Three R's, which is um, an agency that gets government funding in the UK to look at three R's approaches. We're trying to identify areas in the endocrine space, and this gets at AOPs, um, and to try to identify what the toolbox of approaches are to evaluate chemicals that may act through um, androgen, or sorry, F, uh, endocrine pathways. So that workshop was just held, and it was looking at both the existing in vivo approaches and how those might be modified, as well as available in silico and in vitro tools that could help to identify chemicals for which an endocrine pathway may be of concern. So that's just getting rolling, and we have a few papers that we're developing. An area that's relatively new for this project, we had a workshop a few years ago looking at the global sort of scope of effluent assessment. But in the um, North American space, it's estimated that around three to six million fish are used annually just in the US alone for effluent assessment. And so one of the things that we're trying to do within this committee is to evaluate what approaches in this sort of new, new approach methodology space might be applied in the effluent assessment domain. And there's a paper down here, Teresa Norbert King is the first author, that gives kind of this high level overview of some of the methods and approaches that were discussed at the workshop we had a few years ago, which was held in Paris. And we're planning a 2020 workshop, we're looking at June in Toronto, but we're sort of waiting for coronavirus to tell us where we might go next with that. Um, but the idea is to focus really closely on North America, looking particularly at various states that have different states and provinces that have different approaches to effluent assessment and, and try to figure out what the path forward would be, having a very direct conversation with the key regulatory stakeholders. So that's sort of the other projects, and the one I'm gonna talk about today is Envirotox and EcoTTC. So this is probably something all of you are very familiar with, but in ecological risk assessment, and this is the backdrop to a lot of what this committee has been done, we're being asked to do more with new regulations and new pressures, new chemicals, mixtures, more chemicals on the market with less. So we have less resources and in many cases a push towards using less animals and people are asking us to do, do it more quickly and more accurately with less uncertainty, et cetera. So one of the things within this committee that we've identified is the fact that there are new approaches and new methods that are out there and being developed. There's data gaps that need to be filled but we also know that we have quite a bit of toxicology data already that is pretty high quality. And one of the big limitations to any of the new methods that I've come across is the ability to have existing in vivo data in a format that's easily accessible that facilitates some of the comparisons and allows us to do some of this computational work. Um, and also the fact that with those data, we can employ some screening level approaches and and having those data in a format that makes them accessible then allows you to also go back and then create models and tools like QSARs that might be applied more broadly. So the concept that I'll be talking about today that was really the impetus for starting this project is the threshold of toxicological concern, uh, and we could probably do a whole webinar just on this topic, but in a nutshell, the concept behind it is that you can identify de minimis values for many chemicals including those where we don't have any toxicology data, and this is based on structural-based alerts, um, and that you can identify if you have a value, if your exposure is below that value, you would have what we call de minimis risk. It's been applied for a variety of human health endpoints for decades. It was originally developed to assess chemicals found in relatively low concentrations in things like food. Um, it's been used in flavorings and in, in impurities in pharmaceuticals, et cetera. And this is just a cartoon kind of showing the fact that you have a structure, you know that your unknown or your, your chemical for which you don't have data, you have a structure, falls into a particular class. Um, and this is based on the Kramer decision tree approach, which is, is very involved, um, goes through a series of questions related to various things like structural alert and bins chemicals into three different classes. And this was developed based on a, a very robust data set of rodent chronic Noel values. Um, so it's what you see here. And the concept is if you have a chemical and all you have is structure, you determine which of these Kramer classes it falls in. There's actually been a few more that have been derived. Um, and that could help to identify sort of this value that if your exposure is below the value, you would have de minimis risk. And it has various safety factors um, included in it as well. 
So it's an extremely conservative approach, but has been effectively used in cases where you have relatively low exposure. But as we know, there are some differences between ecological and human health risk assessment. And this is when we started on the project, something that was high right at the top of our mind. So for human health, you're looking at one species, generally protection of the individual and effects on toxicity on a target organ. And for ecological risk assessment, with some exceptions, of course, you're, you're looking, at looking at protecting all taxa, many more species. You're looking at various ecosystems, different trophic levels, and you're looking at effects on um, generally on toxicity, uh, looking at growth and reproduction for, for chronic. So those challenges, I think, are pretty obvious. We have a protection target of all species and across ecosystems. Many of the compounds don't have a lot of data and are not well studied, um, which we've already covered in the first presentation. There's limited resources. So space doesn't get the number of resources as human health does. Um, we have regulatory restrictions on vertebrate use, um, especially over in Europe with the cosmetics directive that does apply to fish, and we do need tools for prioritization. So we asked the question, could we apply this concept of a threshold of toxicological concern into the ecological space? So we called this the eco-TTC, and the benefits to this are listed here. I won't go through them in detail, but the, the concept is this using existing knowledge can allow you to make rapid decisions uh, in a screening level approach. It's conservative um, and might be very helpful for chemicals for which you don't have a lot of information. So the Envirotox database and tools um, is, is what is kind of the end game, the end result of what we came up with as far as the, um, the, the database necessary to do this and the tools in order to this question. We did not with this project come up with three threshold values or, or to said, okay, here's the three different classes of chemicals and these are the thresholds. What we wanted to build was a very transparent database that would allow the user to identify um, through various search filters the target that they're looking at. So with human health, they use the, the Kramer class tree. We had a question of what if you wanted to group chemicals based on physical chemical property like log KOW um, and maybe also something related to mode of action. Or maybe you needed to look at particular chemical groups separately than others. Um, and so what we wanted to try to do from the beginning is to create a database and the tools to allow the user to, to probe this question of whether an eco-TTC might be useful. So we created a database. It's publicly available, and it has currently 88,000 curated aquatic toxicity records for around 4,000 different substances. Um, we built a user-friendly filtering interface to allow people to use um, and try out the, the, tool, uh, the tools, and then we have the freely available tools that I'll walk through. So one is just your basic predicted no effect concentration calculator that will take the data that's available for that particular chemical and calculate your PNAC for you in a very transparent way, show you which PNAC groups were used and which application factors were applied, and that way, known differences between U.S. and Europe, those could be, those could be split out. Then we also have an eco-TTC distribution tool. The eco-TTC, by its definition, is a distribution of PNEC, um, and, and I can get into that in a little bit de of more detail. And then we also have the chemical toxicity distribution tool that allows you to just look at the actual data derived for that chemical, for the group of chemicals, without the use of the application factors that are inherent in a PNEC calculation. And we developed this all through this global collaborative partnership, which is how HESI works, bringing together industry, academia, government um, together. And the schematic kind of gives you just an idea of how it works. You have your database, you apply various search filters that I'll, I'll walk through, and you get your target data set. And from that target data set, you can determine whether you want to calculate PNEC and derive and look at your eco-TTC, or you would like to just look at your chemical, your distribution of the toxicity data without application factors. So just starting from the beginning, where did the data come from? They're listed here, they're detailed in the paper. Uh, Kristen Connors is the first author. We pull from existing data sets. So this was not a pull from uh, de novo data sources, but what we wanted to try to do with this is to curate the data to fit the particular application that we had in mind for this. So that's something we've seen a lot of other people go and use Envirotox, which is great, but we want people to keep in mind that it was developed for a particular purpose. So it's not all data. 
It doesn't include um, certain types of data. It doesn't include all um, animals. It's just aquatic species. Um, but, but what we tried to do is build something that was very fit for purpose. And this kind of just gets at how we filtered things through. I won't go, go it in a lot of detail, but when we were looking at this, what we really wanted to try to do is we took the, the metadata, so all the available toxicity data we could get our hands on, and then put it through various filters, which we called SIF, um, that got us to the bottom, which was the, the, the data set of 88,000 records here. Uh, and a lot of the things that we screened out were related to particular acceptance criteria on duration of the test, the test statistic, test statistic, and the effect. And what we were really looking at here were acute and chronic data that were the types of data used to derive PNEX. Um, so if we had different types of tests, we have behavioral endpoints some people are very interested in, but those are not included in this database. And all the um, nitty-gritty details of the database and what was filtered in and out are included in not only the user guide for the database, but also in the paper. So the database allows you to do a search and filter, and if we have time, I can do a quick live demo of it. It's at envirotoxdatabase.org. And what it has here under the advanced search is very easy drop-down menu that allows you to, through various filtering, um, you can do greater than, a KOW value, you can choose based on a consensus mode of action, you could look for a particular individual chemical or a string of chemicals, you can do kind of a batch search for CAS numbers for, for that information, et cetera. So what it allows you to do is create that filtered custom data set based on as many criteria as you, the user, define. And then it spits out your customized data set here. It's hard to see, but it'll give you a tab of how many tests, how many substances, and, um, and how many taxa were included in that search. So in this case, I looked for all of the chemicals for which a consensus mode of action is specifically acting, log KOWs are greater than four, and um, yeah, and that's it. So this is just, just the data set of all the chemicals in Envirotox that meet those criteria. So you, contain, you obtain the tox data for multiple chemicals, so multiple, we use CAS number as our defining criteria that are in a similar, similar group. So in this case, previously, specifically acting mode of action with KOWs greater than four. That's just an example that I used there. Then the next step in the tool is you would determine your cast specific predicted no effect concentrations that have application factors applied. Um, so in this case, this is for US, you have the different PNEC groups and the relative application factors assigned to that depending on the amount of data available. Um, and this is for ECOTTC. Then you would plot the distribution of those PNECs and calculate the lowest fifth percentile value, which gives you your ECOTTC value. And what that looks like here is like this, where you have application factors applied. This is the distribution of the data in, the, in that filtered data set, and it's going to give you your HC5 value here in milligrams per liter. The concept is if your chemical fell within the filtered group that you've defined, you could identify and look at, your, look at your plot, look at the relative uncertainty here, and identify, you know, what, is, what would that HC5 value be? Is my exposure um, concentration going to be below that? And that could give you a conservative idea of whether or not you may have um, a, an issue or not. So that's for ECOTTC. It's very, very conservative because of the use of the PNEX and the inherent application factors in those distributions. For chemical toxicity distribution, it's the same general approach, but you could then say look and just look at all the algae data for that chemical, or you could combine to different trophic levels if you liked as well. Um, and what this does is allows you to look at a distribution that doesn't have application factors. These are different data sets, just so, so you know. The light gray dots are the individual data points, and what this is looking at actually is just a distribution of the algae data um, in the data set. So one other thing that we included in this um, to allow the user to have a little bit more flexibility is um, for mode of action, and this isn't as specific as a full AOP, but there's various mode of action classification schemes that are out there. Um, we looked at VERHAR, OASIS, AFTER, and the US EPA's TEST. And the, the idea behind what we did here is we, we ran each of those mode of action classifications, and you can 
You can get those for your chemical um, in, in Biotox. It'll give you that information separately. But what we wanted to do is take a little bit of a look at across those four different schemes that are commonly used in Ecotox, how do they match up? And can we come up with, for some of these chemicals, some kind of uh, consensus classification? So we didn't go too deep on this, but what we ended up doing is, and this is a, a separate paper, Odd Kinsler is the first author, there's two papers related to this, is could we bin chemicals into either narcotic chemicals, including polar and nonpolar and ester narcotics, specifically acting chemicals, which are probably, you know, the ones that you're talking about, neurotoxic pesticides, they elicit their toxicity through either reactivity or specific receptor binding molecular interaction, or could they not be classified? And so what we wanted to try to do is provide a little bit of guidance across these different schemes related to, could you come up with some generalizations related to mode of action? So that information is included as well and might be very useful as people go forward and work on their, on their grouping. So I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time talking about some of the applications. This is still in a little bit of an early stage because um, we built the tool. We do have plans to update the database probably on a yearly basis and we're in discussions with the US EPA Ecotox group about that, um, about adding more data into the, into the database. Um, obviously not, not that often, maybe on a yearly basis. But now the question is it's gotten out there. We've gotten quite a bit of uh, feedback. We've presented it at CTAC. How might we use and apply this? Um, and this gets at to kind of some of the questions maybe you guys at SFEI might be, be interested in. So in this uh, schematic here, we've had groups that are interested in applying it to mixtures. There's actually a published case study, Odd Kinsler's first author on that publication as well. Uh, how new chemistries might be impactful or how they might be um, used to design new chemicals in the product development space, how new approach methodologies might be evaluated or used in this, in this context. Um, so the couple I'm going to talk about today um, are kind of getting at this criteria value derivation. Um, the approach that we were looking at were identify some target chemicals, whether they're top to high priority candidates or chemicals with very specific modes of action, like neurotoxic pesticides, for example. Compile existing regulatory criteria values and then look and see would the ECOTTC or the CTD help us in a case where we have a chemical that fits within the domain, um, but we, maybe we don't have any data. And we wanted to evaluate the relative conservatism of ECOTTC versus the existing water quality criteria uh, values that are out there. So this is probably uh, something you guys are pretty familiar with, but one of the things that if you look across various regulatory jurisdictions and how they derive their water quality criteria, it's pretty complicated and it really is, is drawing from places um, where, where you have a lot of data, for example. So I won't get into this, but, but bottom line, and I think Dan touched on this, few criteria have been developed because of data limitations. Different regulatory jurisdictions use different approaches and those have varying levels of protectiveness. Uh, and, and looking across all the regulatory jurisdictions and trying to find various criteria values is not necessarily the easiest thing to do. One of the places that we found uh, was this ETOX, which is the Information System for Ecotoxicology and Environmental Quality Targets that the German Environmental Agency has developed called ETOX. And it has criteria for available for various places um, under on protection of aquatic life. So we've used that as a place to identify and pull out various water quality criteria for certain chemicals to get an idea of what's available and what's out there so that we can do some comparisons. So I'm not gonna show kind of the bottom line here because this is something that's still in development, but the question in this case for, this was specifically looking at neurotoxicity. The question in red there, can you use ECOTTC or a chemical toxicity distribution approach to determine a protective water criteria value for a neurotoxicant for which you don't have data or you have very limited data, so maybe not a full data set to develop criteria. So that's one question. The other is, can we move away from developing chemical by chemical water quality criteria and think about grouping-based criteria values and what those groups might look like, how you, how you define those groups, of course, is, is something that we will probably have to continue to look at. But where we started was we just said, okay, if we search in Biotox for chemicals for which ASTER, which is one of the mode of action schemes, contains the term merotoxicant, how much information do we have, how many trigger values do we have, and then how do those various trigger values 
compared to what we would get if it looked at an eco TCC or a chemical toxicity distribution. And what we're looking at right now is comparing the trigger values and separating out different types of neurotoxicants. We have organophosphates, carbamates, and the pyrethroids as kind of the three main groups. So we're in the midst of, of working on that example. Another one that I just want to highlight, because this is something that um, the EPA Pesticide Office was interested in, for acute fish data. So another thing the Envirotox database can do is allow you to explore what data are available and how might you uh, revise needed testing approaches, or how could it help identify testing gaps. In the case of EPA, how might you move away from have to, having to test multiple fish species? Could you still um, get at a level of protection by maybe not requiring as many fish data, for example. So one of the things we did is we just said, okay, let's let's look at acute fish data where your test type is acute and your trophic levels fish. We have a lot of data. Um, and then maybe we narrow it further, chemical where your consensus mode of action is specifically acting. Um, and this would be the case for pesticides. Um, so what you see here is if you just look at the fish data, you have your in your chemical toxicity distribution, your value is 0 0.01 milligrams per liter. Then the question is, well, for many chemicals, especially for pesticides that have a neurotoxic mode of action, the most sensitive fish uh, taxa might not be fish. So we were really, really interested in looking at invertebrates. So we took the same chemicals, looked at acute, fit, acute tests with invertebrates with specific modes of action, and did the same thing. And what you can see here is that our invertebrates have a much lower, uh, two orders of magnitude lower, lower fifth percentile um, CTD, showing that the invertebrates are more sensitive, which many of us know, but it's also very useful to be able to illustrate this using these large data sets like what we have in Envirotox. So just the last couple of slides here, we have several publications that are listed here. This um, PNAC and the acute to chronic ratios for algae are almost um, ready to be submitted, so those should come out soon. Um, all of these papers are open access. You can download them um, from the, the websites. If you have any trouble, you can let me know. I'd be happy to send them to you. And I just also wanted to acknowledge the group of people and uh, partners that have been working on this project from the beginning. They're all listed here. And with that, I think I can take questions. I could always do a demo. It probably um, would be more straightforward to do it maybe on a separate follow-up webinar as needed. but. Um, but happy to answer any questions that may have come through to you, Ezra. Great, Michelle. Thank you so much. It was a great talk. Um, I think Becky has one question. Yeah, just a quick question about the 4,000-ish chemicals that ended up in the Enviro uh, Talks database. Yeah. I was wondering if you could give me some examples of different chemical classes uh, that might be present in the database for the emerging contaminants. Sure. I can actually show you. Oh, great. <laughs> um, where is the figure? I'm trying to. Sorry, just trying to find it. I thought I had it here. It might be a bigger guide. It's a pretty broad swath of different chemistries involved, and there is not. Sorry, I have a, a figure that shows the chemical space, and it's sorry to make you guys busy here. Thought it was in. It's great that all your publications are open access. <laughs> yes, yeah, and this is the. Yeah, maybe it's not. I'm trying to remember where it is here. Hold on, just one second. Bear with me. It's a pretty. So while Michelle looks for that figure real quick, involved. I just sorry? wanted to. Sorry, I just wanted to point out for folks, if you were panicking that you couldn't write down all those papers in time, um, I think we'll be making uh, the presentations available on our website in addition to the webinar itself, so you don't need to worry about taking screenshots or be sad that you missed <laughs> the information. Um, it will be uh, available to you in the next week or so. Um, Sorry, I can't seem to find the figure that I'm looking for here. It might be in the, oh, here we go. Ah. So this is just the, the most chronic group within, there's like the ecosar classifications. 
Um, we know that there's some gaps where there aren't a lot of data, um, sure. but this is sort of just the 10 most common classes of, of chemistries involved. The other thing I just want to mention really briefly is we also built it, and I'd be happy to, it, it, it'd be easier just to do it through a separate webinar. We built it so that you could, if you had your own data, you could still use the distribution tools and the PNEC tools. So the way it works is you, you create a filtered data set, you get an Excel download. You could add your own data if you, for example, there was a class of chemistry you were, you were interested in looking at distributions and how it fit with everything else, but those data weren't included in the database of this version or it's proprietary. Um, and you could add those into the Excel file that you download and then upload it to be able to use the distribution tools. And we built that in because we know that for some of these chemistries, the science is evolving so quickly that those data might not be in the database. The Great, other thanks. part of it is you can go to it and you could download the whole, you know, you can look at the entire database and even just, you know, get it as an Excel file if you really would like to look at that many records. But it's all openly available on the website. And so you can go and search and um, kind of take a look at, um, even in the drop downs, what comes up related to the ECOSAR classes and how many, how many um, chemicals were, are in your particular class, if you'd like to. Does that help your question? All right. Um, so a reminder for folks, if you have questions, email them to talks at sfei.org. Um, I don't see any questions yet, uh, and I did want to give folks a chance to um, have a bio break. And so, um, Michelle, if you wouldn't mind sticking around for a few more minutes in case someone's question appears last minute, but um, we're going to take back control yeah. and uh, go ahead and have our 15-minute break now. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so our next presenter is Nil Basu from McGill University, um, who will be talking about Canada's uh, big effort for the Ecotox chip project. So I'll get started. Uh, thanks, uh, Ezra, SE, EI, and others for having me here today. Uh, I do apologize. I just ran in right now from teaching a class, and right after this, I have to rush to another um, meeting. So. I can't participate for the um, uh, entire session, but if people do have questions, um, maybe there'll be some time for questions now, or uh, you can always email me at the end. So my goal here today is to give a relatively high level overview of the Ecotox chip project, which is really a partnership between a number of academics in Canada with uh, Canadian government researchers and regulators and managers, along with folks in the US, and in the private sector. And you can see a couple of the key institutions involved on the bottom of this slide. So as we're all aware, there is a great challenge in our world in terms of uh, chemicals management and uh, in jurisdictions crossing North America and into European Union, there are thousands if not tens of thousands of chemicals that need to be evaluated. Um, and then beyond the chemicals that we tend to um, uh, concern ourselves with, there exists countless numbers of complex uh, environmental samples. So uh, contaminated sediments, water and effluents that in Canada need to be monitored underneath the Fisheries Act. And this in itself uh, uh, poses tremendous financial and other barriers for uh, partners. So the status quo, as we're all aware of, is that toxicity testing really hasn't changed in decades. And we still rely upon the outcomes of short and long-term exposures using extensive live animal tests. And this is costly. It takes a lot of time, um, a lot of money, and a lot of animal lives being lost. Uh, furthermore, um, especially in environmental sciences, there are only a handful of model species that we are able to adequately study in uh, laboratory settings. And when we try to take the results of these to uh, extrapolate risk in natural populations with native species, uh, the risk predictions are relatively poor. So what we've seen over the last decade is really an urgent demand worldwide for improved testing tools that are way more efficient, uh, affordable and accessible, that are flexible and fit for purpose, and much less dependent upon animal studies. So this is, again, is something I think everyone here is familiar with. Uh, we've been able to observe in the last uh, decade or so a number of uh, successes that really inform, uh, have informed the design of the Ecotox chip project. So 
Uh, many of us may be familiar with the U.S. National Research Council report in 2007 talking about a paradigm shift being needed in toxicity testing, uh, calling for the community to uh, harness new and emerging approaches in systems biology, toxicogenomics, and bioinformatics. And when we view uh, what's going on in the human health side um, through programs such as the ToxCast program, we're starting to see changes um, in that risk assessment and testing is turning into a process that's a bit more cost-effective, timely, and predictive. On the ecological side, there are also some successes to be noted, and uh, one in particular note is the avian tox chip. This is a small panel of genes placed onto a qPCR array, so a, a small genomics array that you can buy from Kaigen, which is a large uh, uh, multinational company, that was developed by members of our project team. So um, in our project team, we have government scientists who um, um, initially thought of the idea of placing onto a qPCR array a couple dozen genes that the scientific community and the regulatory community understand, they trust, and would consider using in a screening and prioritization context. So this was done, and the prototype and the data I'll show you momentarily was really embraced by the Canadian regulatory community, uh, including environmental monitoring programs, but also gain legitimacy in the scientific community. So there are two examples that really lay the foundation for the Ecotox chip. One was the use of the avian tox chip um, uh, to compare transcriptomic gene expression signatures of more than 25 priority flame retardants uh, to assist in chemical prioritization for follow-up in vivo studies. So uh, in doing so, uh, using this in vitro approach coupled with the toxicogenomic solution, the scientists were able to realize results in a matter of weeks for a fraction of the cost that would be realized with whole animal tests. And the regulators, for their part, were very enamored with the type of data, so much so that they placed the transcriptomic data into their screening assessment reports. So it gave us one of the early uh, first early indications that this type of approach, by looking at alternative embryo models and vitro models, coupling them with toxicogenomics, uh, and screening larger panels of chemicals in a rapid time period, can uh, be of interest to the regulatory community. Next, our colleagues went uh, and applied this technique in the field. So in Canada, we do a lot of monitoring in various sites across the country, so in the Great Lakes and the oil sands regions. And to do these types of studies is very uh, uh, resource intensive. So it takes a lot of time and money. The traditional way of doing field work, uh, on one hand, many of us enjoy it. But on the other hand, it's uh, again, it's um, uh, resource intensive. So what we did in this case was to take simple extract from variably contaminated sites across the Great Lakes and the oil sands region, um, process those in the laboratory, expose them to an in vitro model, link that with a toxicogenomic solution, which is the avian tox chip, and lo and behold, the gene expression signatures we found with this relatively rapid tool mirrored almost identical the results from the more comprehensive and labor-intensive field studies. So we were able to document in this case study a more cost-effective tool and this paper actually went on in the journal Environmental Science and Technology to be the second runner-up prize as best paper in 2015. So it also gives us some scientific legitimacy in taking these new technologies to do environmental management projects. The second template for success which underpins a project is, on one hand, we're being pushed to try and develop um, and advocate for new bioinformatics solutions uh, that harness systems biology. But on the other hand, many users, even those in the scientific community, struggle um, enormously to be able to make judgments from complex genomic signatures. Uh, part of this is related to lack of training. Part of this is related to the lack of knowledge in terms of how we distill this complex and big data into knowledge. So one of the key researchers in our team took this upon himself starting about 15 years ago, largely driven from the human health side to essentially democratize omics data. And what Professor Shia has been able to do is to create a series of tools listed here on the bottom, uh, again, over the last 15, uh, 20 years. Um, and in doing so, he's been able to make accessible to the community metabolomics data, gene expression data, and microbiome data. And what we can see here is that it's gained tremendous uh, 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 following in the larger scientific community with more than 2 million people using these online tools per year. 
And this just gives you a sense of the user community around the world. Now, I'm so, going to interrupt you for just a second. Can you click okay. hide on the Join Me uh, app thing so that we... Uh, um, Is that better? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Great. So taking lessons learned from those uh, 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 studies I mentioned right now, the success of the Avian Talks chip and the um, interest of the regulators for more data like that, um, and the success from Metaboanalyst and the various cloud-based tools to make more accessible this type of data, we then came up with this idea to develop, to test, validate, and commercialize uh, Ecotox chips, and also a data valuation tool for the characterization, prioritization, management of environmental chemicals and complex mixtures of regulatory concern. So again, the status quo uh, running along the top is to do um, animal tests on chemicals and then make decisions. Our vision for an Ecotox chip-based program is to take the chemicals and uh, instead of exposing them to uh, animals for weeks and maybe longer, is to run very short day, three, four day um, uh, acute exposures on early life stage models. So focus on embryos that aren't considered technically animals um, and do it in a rapid period. Uh, instead of seeing if they live or die, uh, so the count and kill them notion, instead of doing that, to har uh, harvest the livers or tissues, and then look at a panel of about 370 genes that we feel uh, can be viewed as sentinel genes to give a wide uh, range of understanding of what type of pathways are being perturbed in that um, uh, species. Uh, and then from that, we can use the Explorer to make judgments whether or not that chemical is of concern or not. And if that chemical is thus of concern and prioritized, it can then be flagged for future animal studies. But the idea here is to actually use this in a screening way so as to triage most of the chemicals. So um, we envision this fitting nicely into a screening and prioritization project. So the deliverables from the project are as follows. Uh, the first deliverable are to realize Ecotox chips for three key vertebrate models used globally, worldwide in risk assessments. So we picked a representative fish, frog, and bird. Uh, these are ones that have OECD or Environment Canada or EPA guidelines. They're ones that are used by uh, uh, the regulatory community and also the regulated community. Uh, they're ones that contract research labs uh, uh, are very, very familiar with. So we felt it was important to uh, look carefully at the guidance documents for these exposure studies. For each one, also look at the early life stage uh, uh, test being proposed and then to provide uh, drop-in solutions in terms of Ecotox chips and Ecotox Explorer components to uh, essentially uh, drop into the workflow that exists right now. The next thing that we were tasked with doing is that after showing that we can develop this for some of the most important model species is that our partners in Canada really wanted us to demonstrate how quickly could we realize native species Ecotox chips. So there are a range of species across the country that are of commercial or recreational or indigenous concerns. Uh, so again, we picked a representative fish, frog, and bird that the government of Canada monitors actively across the country, uh, has concerns about in terms of commercial, recreational, or aboriginal interests, um, and are also ones that they feel that they can use an Ecotox chip for. And in doing so, it gives us a sense of how quickly we can turn around custom Ecotox chips for any species. Number three, following the uh, uh, previous experiences team members have had in, in creating cloud-based tools was to create ecotoxexplorer.ca as an online data evaluation tool that provides functions to allow users to upload their data and interpret results. Um, depending on the user, uh, very simply, once you upload a chip, you may get a result that's a simple red light, green light. And depending upon your comfort with this type of data, you may stop right there. But if you want to go deeper, you can certainly look underneath the hood and start to identify which pathways and processes um, might be perturbed, what's the quality of the data, so on and so forth. So Ecotox Explorer right now, uh, I would say a good beta version of it is online and people are using it. And then finally, to make sure that the um, uh, user community, so the regulators and our partners in uh, academia and in business and in other government agencies can adopt these tools, uh, we have social sciences research that is being used to uh, uh, derive government vetted resource documents, uh, uh, sort of SOPs. 
And I should just point out this acronym GELS. It stands for Genomics, the Ethical, Economic, uh, Environmental, Legal, and Societal Costs. One thing about these large Genome Canada grants, so this is funded through one of the large-scale Genome Canada programs in the Canada, and uh, they mandate that every science team has a very strong social sciences component to it. So we have a very robust group of social science researchers on the team that are uh, embedded all throughout the project. So this gives you a sense of the progress towards our deliverables. Uh, basically, the way the work is uh, proceeding is that in phase one, we focus on those three model species. We expose them to a panel of eight chemicals that we've carefully chosen with our regulatory partners. Uh, we expose the adults of these um, animals, but also the early life stage models. So for example, we have uh, juvenile Japanese quail that were exposed, as well as Japanese quail's eggs that were injected. Uh, ditto for the fathead minnow and the xenopus. Um, we harvest tissues from all these studies and we subject them to a full omics blast. So we look at RNA sequencing, the whole transcriptome. We do the whole proteome. We do targeted metabolomics. We take apical measurements and we take together all this omics data to really um, understand what are the 370 or so most responsive and useful genes. Based on that, we go to our partners in Kyogen and they manufacture for us the Ecotox chips, um, and then they send those back to us to do tests. And then as we start to realize uh, more uh, advanced versions of the Ecotox chips, we start to work with a larger uh, group of end users. So we have partners in the US, uh, we have partners across Canada, we have partners in the private sector and in the government who are starting to now take these Ecotox chips and to test them out in their own labs to give us testimonials on how the chips work and how the Explorer performs. Uh, do the data make sense to them? Are these data that they can use? And we work in a collaborative manner with them to improve all the project deliverables. Also in doing so, we're able to greatly expand the number of chemicals that we're able to test with the Ecotox chips from eight to we hope to a couple dozen, maybe hitting 40 or 50. So phase one is well underway right now. Uh, we've also gotten a lot going on phase number two and you can see the progress on the right hand side here. Um, on the bottom, activities eight and nine are really the bioinformatics pipeline that underpins all the work, and the social sciences research uh, is activity number nine. So just to give you a sense of where we are, uh, again, Ecotox chips are available now. Um, if you are to get a box, so you see on the bottom here is an Ecotox chip box from Kyogen. You open it up. It's got an instruction manual as shown on the upper left-hand side. So again, we want to make sure this instruction manual works. Uh, so as our partners and internal project members are using uh, the, the manual, they can give us advice on what phrases make sense, what aspects of the flow diagrams work or don't work, so on and so forth. Uh, on the upper right is Emily, one of our key research uh, managers, running the first Ecotox chip. And on the bottom right here is one of our first major results, which um, uh, do a side-by-side -side comparison on the same sample, looking at Ecotox chip results on the x-axis, against RNA sequencing, so whole transcriptome results on the y-axis, and we can see that the chip results, uh, uh, minus a couple of technical issues that we still need to resolve and get rid of, um, uh, have a correlation coefficient uh, uh, efficient of close to uh, uh, 80 to 90%. So we feel confident that the chips are performing technically well. Uh, this just gives you a sense of the pipeline and where we are on the project. So we started in 2016, 2017, it took a year or so to get the project off the ground. Uh, and again, we're realizing chips for the quail, for the fatted minnow, for the xenopus. We're here right now. So for each of the species, we have a very strong design thinking element built into the project where we come up with the initial version 0.1 chips. We test those out in house to make sure technically they're working well, that the packaging looks good, that the delivery systems are set. We then take that knowledge and go back uh, within the team, but also to our partners at Kyogen and update the chip by swapping out a number of genes and making enhancements to it uh, to realize the first version of the chip, which we call the beta version. Uh, we then start to realize the gamma version, which is version two, which will largely be shared with our partners. So you can see on this diagram here that we initially focused the work on the quail because this is what is really driven from our past avian talks chip. And, uh, uh, we just continuously iterate. So on a three-month cycle, we're transitioning different versions of different Ecotox chips, but also transitioning to new species. So right now, we have the first version, version one of the Japanese quail chip, and the initial versions of the fatted minnow and xenopus uh, chip. 
So this is the plan for testing the versions. And this also introduces a bit of the validation plan. So in the first version, the version zero, which we affectionately call version 0.1, uh, these are internal tests. So Kaijin does a number of tests in-house to make sure that the primers are efficient, that uh, the various um, uh, bioinformatics designs are set. Uh, and in each of our core scientific steering committee labs, the SSC labs, we do internal tests as well, too. Once these internal tests are done, we then uh, commission the next version plate to be manufactured. And that's where we do technical tests. That's where, for example, we have a pool of cDNA, uh, an exact same pool of cDNA that we share with a number of labs. And each of the labs will run the exact same sample. And what we expect to see is that there's minimal variance, which we're starting to see. We also do a concordance test. So this is where we want to make sure that the results from the qPCR Ecotox chip are the same as what you would get from other gene expression platforms, such as RNA sequencing. Once we finish the version one test, we then update the chips again. Uh, and realize the version two chips. And this is where we go to our external partners to ask them to test the chips out. Uh, they're given a couple hundred chips. Uh, many of them have a range of very interesting projects underway that have tremendous uh, metadata associated with them. Uh, they have uh, great technical staffs that can uh, give us testimonials as to the user experience. So all that information will be very valuable to us in terms of improving the Ecotox chip, just not technically, but also from the user perspective. In version two, we're also running a ring test. So this is where uh, for the fat minnow, we'll have three labs involved that will each test the same three chemicals and hopefully they get the same results. We'll do the exact same thing for the Japanese quail where we have three labs involved. They will test three chemicals in blind and hopefully they get the same results as well too. And we're also starting a series of benchmark dose tests. There's a lot of interest over the last few years in terms of calculating transcriptomics point of departure. So T-pods or benchmark doses. So we've also um, uh, have started to design a series of benchmark dose studies that we'll conduct with the version two tests. From this uh, uh, rigorous testing with our internal and our core external partners, we're then gonna launch version three chips in which um, if in the project, we've had a number of people come to us asking us if they can get involved. So this is where we expand the coalition and uh, we are trying to identify a number of core new partners to bring a board who can test this as part of external cases, but also we want to launch some internal cases. So each of us in the project that are scientific researchers, we have a range of our own personal interests, and this is where we want to try the Ecotox chips in our own uh, 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 research programs. So as I mentioned before, the Explorer is live, and this is a data evaluation tool that really allows users to make judgments. You can see the initial version of the Explorer here, uh, we got a lot of feedback from our partners and just realized the version two on the bottom left. And you can see version three on the right hand side has a completely different design to it. And this is where, again, um, design thinking has been a really critical feature of our project. We spend a lot of time sitting down, speaking with our partners, uh, especially prioritizing the Canadian regulators to understand how they would use this type of data, what they want the workflows to look at, uh, what visual uh, aesthetic elements uh, appeal to them and which don't. So we're continuously sitting down with them to try to uh, improve the user experience. So again, the, the website is live and you're all welcome to try it. Uh, I'll just run you through some screenshots. So what you can do is to go to the Ecotox um, Explorer website uh, and on the bottom, you can click try an example. And when you click try an example, you'll see a bunch of case studies emerge and you can press submit there. Uh, on the next page, you can look at the actual layout of it, uh, Ecotox chip plate. And this plate layout on the right hand side is simply representing the um, RNA sequencing expression data. So you can see where some hotspots may be. You can hover over the wells and it'll tell you what gene it is. Uh, you can look at various quality control metrics by going through all the tabs here. So for example, you can look at the density plot to see if all the plates in a, in a single experiment um, look similar. Uh, you can do this through box plots and PCA plots. So we integrate a range of quality control parameters here to give the user confidence that the data is of high, high quality. If there are issues, we will flag them. Uh, at any point, there are question marks throughout so you can understand uh, what calculations are being performed and get some more information. And on every page, you can download the data set. Uh, moving along, there are steps to normalize the data. So uh, as you move through the Ecotox Explorer, it gets more sophisticated in terms of what you can do. 
Uh, so there are a range of features here to normalize the data uh, and to draw certain comparisons. There are statistical features built in, and ultimately it culminates with various visualization tools. Now, this is one that we're not um, especially proud of, but we're certainly working on. So it's a circus plot or a ring diagram, each of the genes on the outside. And what we're trying to do is to reorganize genes into biological processes and modules that resonate with the environmental management community. So right now, when we look at large transcriptomics data sets, we tend to um, map these to uh, biological um, uh, naming systems that are designed in the life sciences and in human disease and human biology that don't resonate well with environmental practitioners and managers. So sitting down with uh, our colleagues in the government especially, what we did is uh, work with them to identify 20 or so different um, uh, biological processes that are familiar to the regulatory community that they would feel comfortable in terms of um, uh, making judgments on. In doing so, we looked at the existing frameworks for organizing genes, and we essentially recoded them into either signaling pathways, into metabolism pathways, into immune pathways, into endocrine or cellular ones, within which there are 21 distinct modules that we came up with. And here's just one case study that we published recently advocating for this approach in which we looked at an existing FAT amino uh, microarray data set, looked at it using the traditional ways of bioinformatics and analysis, and looked at it using uh, uh, this new modular approach and sat down with the regulatory community. And lo and behold, they found this version on the screen here a bit more palatable to use. So there'll be features like this in the Explore to also make uh, genomics data more uh, palatable to the uh, end user community. One new and exciting tool that we just published online right now is called FastBMD. Uh, this is a tool that intends to make transcriptomic point of departure analysis much more accessible and user friendly. So right now, as I mentioned earlier, there's tremendous interest in calculating transcriptomic point of departures going back to Rusty Thomas's work maybe uh, six, seven years ago, in which he showed that transcriptomic changes are highly predictive, but also protective of apical changes um, uh, following uh, studies done in one or two year cancer um, uh, studies in uh, rodents. Uh, there's been great interest in coming up with in vitro or early life stage exposure studies that are days or weeks long and coupling them with uh, transcriptomic measurements. And the tool most people use right now, if you're not building your own tool in R, uh, you might be using tools such as VMD Express. Um, and while this is a very valuable tool, it uh, requires a lot of computational power um, and it takes a long time to perform analysis. So right now, if you take a data set and you plunk it through BMD Express, it might take hours to perform. So we realized that a lot of this can be recoded in R scripts and placed on an online website. And in doing so, we created FastBMD, and you can run through the examples in FastBMD and essentially calculate a transcriptomic point of departure or a transcriptomic BMD in a matter of minutes versus hours. So this is a tool that's just online. It came online maybe two, three weeks ago. Uh, the first paper describing it will be submitted any day now. And um, again, this is something that we see, especially in Canada amongst the regulatory community, of really, really being of uh, tremendous interest to them. So I encourage those of you interested in calculating T-pods or BMDs to check out this tool. Uh, we've taken steps to market the product. So again, most of us are scientists. We know nothing about business, but uh, we've been pushed tremendously by our advisory committee and our stakeholders to try to find ways to better market the product. So many of us go to the Society of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry CTAC meeting. And in the last few years, if you go to the meeting, you might see the Ecotox Chip Project team. On the left-hand side there, we have a vendor booth. Uh, over the next year, we've identified four meetings uh, uh, worldwide. So um, a meeting in the Netherlands, in Singapore, uh, in the U.S., in Canada, in which we're going to take the Ecotox Chip Project team on the road. Uh, on the upper right here um, is a Ecotox Chip launch party that Kaijin sponsored for us in the SeaTac Toronto meeting. So this is the first time we were officially able to publicly announced the launch of the Ecotox chip line. And then in terms of just background information on the project, uh, there is a, uh, a ETNC focus article that's been published that can give uh, people interested a high level overview of the project. So we're currently validating the, the, the chips. So on the left-hand side, I alluded to this earlier, 
we had three labs uh, be provided with the exact same samples. And lo and behold, the labs got the exact same results. So there was good cross lab validation, but also within each lab, each lab tested each sample five times and the mean uh, variability is less than 2.5%. So tremendous inter and intra lab variability. And then I alluded to this earlier as well too. We're seeing tremendous concordance between uh, the Ecotox chip results and RNA sequencing. So we're doing a lot of technical validation right now. But technical validation only gets us so far. Uh, what might be just as important as technical validation is to get user buy-in and the user experience. So this was the session that a few of us ran at the CTAC Toronto meeting in which we presented uh, various data analysis tools. So we had a number of people express interest in the Ecotox Explorer, and we've been able to work with a number of these people post-Toronto to get their testimonials and their advice and input in how to improve their own user experience and using these tools. And really what we're doing is really validating through our design thinking philosophies. So we've had a consulting organization work with us to really embed into the project design thinking principles through all stages. And in working with them, we're able to give the project focus. So one thing is that we can't do everything for everyone. So sitting with our partners and working through a consulting firm, we decided to focus the Ecotox chip project on risk assessment activities internal needs of our private sector partners and environmental monitoring activities by Environment Canada. So those are the prioritized journeys that we're now building the project around. And then more specific uh, decision-making context involves A, which is screening activities, B, which is the identification of hazard or uh, mode of action uh, type analyses, and three is to work with complex samples. So if we start to uh, test the version one and version two of the Ecotox chips. You may recall that slide earlier. We'll build a purposeful case studies with people doing environmental monitoring, those that do chemical risk assessment in the government, and private sector partners in uh, industry who want to use this for internal R&D. Again, the project is truly interdisciplinary in which we bring together bioinformatics specialists with chemists, with omics specialists, with uh, big data specialists, with social scientists, uh, this gives you a sense of the various core partners in the project and where they fit in. Uh, and really, as I mentioned before, the project is one that has to be driven by the users. So as you see all the groups on the right-hand side, they're mainly focusing on our regulatory partners, Environment and Climate Change Canada. They're the ones that are really driving uh, the research activities. So with that being said, I'll take any questions now, or you can learn more from the website or shoot us an email at info at ecotoxchip.ca. Thanks. Thanks for that great talk. Um, it looks like we're running a little bit over on time, so I'm going to suggest that we move on. Um, and uh, and move on to our next talk. And if you have questions, you can email Nil directly, or you can uh, email us at talks at sfei.org, and then um, we will act as an intermediary for the questions. Um, so up next, we have Suzanne Brander from Oregon State University, uh, who is now presenting. Yes. Great. Thank you so much, um, Ezra, for the invitation to speak today. Um, we heard a lot of amazing talks about predictive toxicology, using uh, big data to make predictions on um, how organisms are going to respond across large numbers of chemicals. Um, for my talk, I'm going to take a little bit of a step back and talk about some additional factors that we should um, perhaps be considering when assessing, assessing the risk of CEC exposure to aquatic organisms. This has relevance across both freshwater, um, estuarine, and marine organisms, but has particular relevance to the San Francisco Bay Delta, so I thought it would be appropriate for today. Um, before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge um, a number. Oh, oh, my screen froze for a second. I'd like to acknowledge a, num a number of wonderful collaborators and students, um, and acknowledge that this work has occurred across um, about four different grants, either from EPA, NSF, or the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. We'll be talking about a variety of different projects, and the focus for today is mainly going to be on the estrin model, Manidia. Alina. 
Um, we know it's found throughout coastal North America. It's an important species in food webs. Um, and it's used nationwide for whole effluent toxicity tests. Um, it's easy to keep in the lab and has certain characteristics that make it sensitive to contaminants of emerging concerns, such as endocrine disrupting compounds. Um, and a number of publications have been out over the past 10 years or so from my lab and also from other groups. Um, today, I'm going to focus my talk on multiple stressors, um, which some of which have particular relevance to estuaries. So thinking a bit about endocrine disrupting chemicals, but also emphasizing that these stressors need to be thought about in the context of um, global climate change. Um, we know that temperatures are predicted to increase um, uh, based on various scenarios over the next century. Um, we know that along with increases in temperature, predicted variability and salinity um, is also is also forecasted. And of course, there are um, what what we refer to often as novel pollutants on the scene, such as microplastics, that have actually been present for for a long time at this point, that cause us to have new considerations in how to evaluate um, responses to environmental stress. So um, as, as a lot of us know, it's, it's pretty challenging to try to mimic what's going on in the field, in the lab, and, and, you know, even, you know, in most of our labs, even when we're trying to make this environmentally relevant, our exposures look more like the beaker on the left, while in reality, what's happening is, of course, more like what is pictured on the right. Um, so often traditional toxicity testing does not account for factors like temperature and salinity um, stress that are relevant to how estuarine organisms are going to respond to toxicant uh, and other stressor exposure. So a few examples from work that we've been doing over the past several years, um, and again, this is work, um, some of which is funded by the uh, Department of Fisheries and Wildlife in California and Environmental Protection Agency. But a lot of focus um, is now being put on potential differences in chemical behavior that could influence, uh, influence responses to chemical exposure in estrogen organisms related to salinity. And so what we're finding with a common class of, uh, of pesticides, um, pyrethroid pesticides, which are used across the U.S. and also in Europe now, is that their, um, their, the fraction in water varies depending on salinity. And this, just is, this isn't just thinking about fresh water versus salt water. But this is relevant to salinities that are found in, in estuaries, such as the San Francisco Bay Delta. So here we're looking across um, a number of different commonly used pyrethroids and looking at changes in the fraction in water from 0 0.5 parts per million to 6 parts per million over a 24-hour period. So factoring in that some of those pesticides that settle out of the water. So it's clear that chemical behavior um, can change the salinity, and this has been shown been shown by others. Um, and we're seeing that this has implications for um, fish exposure. And so one example is that we've been looking at resistant Hyalella Azteca, um, which uh, it's been found that they can develop resistance to organophosphates and pyrethroids due to specific point mutations, which I won't go into here. Um, and that this is going to influence bioaccumulation of these hydrophobic chemicals such as permethrin in fish species. And, and really it seems that the accumulation of these chemicals as well as the amount of biotransformation that's under, that's happening is, is dependent upon species and also potentially dependent upon, upon salinity. Um, and this kind of, this other graph kind of breaks it down a little bit more, looking at the percent of uh, parent compounds versus um, what the remainder would be the biotransformation product, so uh, what the fish uh, metabolizes um, once the compound enters its body. You can see that the percent of the parent compound is dependent not only just on salinity, um, but also on changes in temperature and that at higher temperatures and salinities, you have a higher percentage of that parent compound found in the tissue of fish. So I won't talk a lot about microplastics today, but 
want to mention that in addition to how salinity can affect the behavior of soluble um, chemicals, it also can affect the behavior of plastics, um, particularly nanoplastics, which are less steady than uh, microplastics, which we've heard a lot about um, in the past few years. Um, so some recent work um, that is NSF funded is we're looking at behavior of uh, not just microparticles, but nanoplastics in water. And something we're finding, and this is preliminary data, is that nanoplastic agglomeration increases as salinity gets higher. And again, we're not talking about full strength marine salinities here. We got up to about 15 grams per liter um, in this case, and we're seeing significant clumping of those particles at higher salinities versus then becoming more dispersed at lower salinities, which is also going to affect how organisms interact with these particles. We're also finding, of course, the temperature matters, and this is not, not surprising, but it's something that I think is less considered when it comes to factoring in how mutants are going to affect aquatic organisms, even though we know that temperature is predicted to increase. And so some work that we completed a couple of years ago showed that fish born to parents exposed to warmer temperatures and endocrine disruptors can have altered sex ratios. Um, this is something that's also been shown in freshwater species, such as a zebrafish. Um, we see that, um, that even though you get more females in warmer water, you might have some conditions that induce uh, sex ratio being skewed towards females. That doesn't necessarily mean you get more viable offspring. The warmer treatments across the board, regardless of chemical, had fewer offspring. Um, and then warmer EDC treatments also tend to have more deformities. And I will, I will say here we only looked at two chemicals and would like to look across more, but this has been shown um, across the literature to be a potential issue that temperature can exacerbate um, pollutant effects in aquatic organisms. So just showing examples of the um, pigment change and size change in these, these fish. So we also have found, and, and across the board, others have found too, that, that generations, of course, matter as well. And it's difficult with uh, reduced funding and reduced time to assess, as has been mentioned this morning, thousands of new chemicals on the scene, that it's, it's difficult to think that we might need to take a step back and think about what's happening in subsequent generations. Um, but it is now really well established that alterations of patterns and gene expression um, can be heritable even when they're occurring outside of changes within the DNA sequence itself. Um, and this, um, this is referred to as the epigenome, which is particularly sensitive during early life. And I won't go into all the details on this. I'm just going to talk about DNA translation, um, which is the addition of a methyl group to the DNA base cytosine, which is really at least in aquatic organisms, probably the most well-studied and well-understood um, epigenetic mechanism at this point. Um, we know that in other fish, fish species, such as uh, Madaka, that the parent or estero generation that's exposed to something like an exogenous estrogen for seven days during early life, it can cause reduced fecundity out to the F2 generation um, and reduction in embryo survival out to the F3. In zebrafish, um, similarly, exposure to parents um, is then resulting in effects that are extending through the F2 generation. And these are risk assessment or um, fitness relevant effects when you're thinking about reductions in the number of offspring you're producing, which could have population level implications. So there are a number of groups, most, mostly on the um, human health side at this point, thinking about using epigenetic tags as biomarkers for certain types of cancer, for example. And I could see the ecotox field moving in this direction. Um, as far as multi-generational testing that we've done um, in my group, we've looked at the effects of chemical exposure isolated to parental um, early life stages and then rear fish in clean water uh, across a couple of generations out to the F2 and looked at a number of different population risk assessment relevant endpoints such as fecundity and immune response um, and embryonic deformities as well as, as trying to link it back to particular 
endpoints um, like DNA isolation and gene expression. Um, not expecting you to take this entire table in, but just want to get across the point that it's possible to collect data on endpoints um, grouped into categories such as larval health, um, immune response and reproduction, as well as um, gene expression and methylation. And, and what we found is that um, particularly in the F1, you see these carryover effects that may be a result of fish being exposed um, during uh, the primordial germ cell stage within their early life stage parents. Um, or it could be a result of gene methylation or changes in gene expression. Another thing we found is that across all the different chemicals we tested, that gene methylation appears to be a bit more stable, that we see a stronger connection between methylated genes and higher level endpoints, like changes in uh, development or reproduction um, or fecundity. So, we also see that methylation differences overall increase with each generation. And unlike some other um, other organisms that have been have been analyzed, genes in in, in silver size and also another fish species are often more methylated within gene body regions rather than in the regulatory regions um, upstream of genes. And that's something we're still trying to understand a bit better. Um, but getting back to the big data question, how do you how do you take all of this information and boil it down into into um, into a summary that makes sense for risk assessment? You know, what does this what does all of this what do all of these data mean? Because high throughput sequencing produces lists of thousands upon thousands of differentially methylated in this case. And so, uh, by using functional analysis, you can identify which biological functions are most enriched or most significantly affected, um, and then group those and then group those together, uh, genes together based on similar trends and, and effects. So, one example um, was using uh, something called the Coyote, Coyote Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes, which is a common approach used for assessing RNA seq data um, as well as DNA data for exposures in early life to low levels of contaminants of emerging concern, we found enrichment um, in processes and pathways that control everything from growth and development to pigmentation, as we were showing those um, fish earlier that had that defect where they were darker in pigmentation, for example, to um, stress response and repair, and this includes um, some carcinogenesis pathways. So, Putting it all together, you know, it's it's a bit easier at this point to take things like effects on de or, or deformities or effects on larval survival or egg production and take those concrete numbers and plug them into a model to predict what's going to happen at the population level. And so for some of the epigenetic exposures, we did just that, and I'm only going to show one example here. But we tried to simulate not just a single exposure history, which is what we did in the um, experiments that I described a couple of slides ago. So this is where we had exposed embryos, and then we were curious as to what would happen out to the F2 generation, considering they had only been exposed once. And so you can use something called a delay coordinate model, which is age and size structure. It factors in all of those fitness relevant endpoints and is parameterized based on lab experiments. And then you can also simulate what would be more realistic in the field, which is a chronic exposure history. And so you can take data from that one experiment, plug it in, and assume that fish are going to be continuously exposed rather than only exposed in a single event. And so basically what this is doing again is keeping track of the abundance of fish at time T across all of these different um, sizes and ages and generations, as well as sex, so male versus female. And just to show one example um, with bisemprin, if you're just considering a single parental exposure with no subsequent exposure, which is not necessarily realistic um, in the field, you, you see a recovery 
of those fish um, after that single exposure. And so here, what it's showing on the on the right, each of these lines represents a different combination of of generations or other factors. So you've got parent only, parent and offspring, parent offspring and grand offspring. And then you can also consider, you know, whether only the males were, were exposed. But if you model this as a chronic exposure based on those empirical data that we collected in the lab, um, you see that over time, and Again, this is an annual fish, and so they're going to produce a new cohort every year. You see that over time, you get a larger decrease in relative population size, depending on the combination of generations you're, you're considering here. So how do we put this all together, which is always the big question, and you've already heard um, other speakers this morning talk about adverse outcome pathways, um, just to remind everyone that the construct that portrays existing knowledge um, concerning linkages between molecular initiating events and an adverse outcome um, at a level of organization relevant to regulatory decisions. So as, as it stands, the, stands, the basic AOP is, is outlined here as it was originally um, conceived, and regulatory endpoints considered really to this day and, and what we're, you know, the reason we're convening here to talk about omics, we're still mostly thinking about lethality and impaired development and impaired reproduction and how those things affect structure, recruitment, and extinction. Um, but given recent findings, it seems that it's important to consider DNA methylation and other epigenetic mechanisms as molecular initiating events um, on their, of their own accord to think about transgenerational responses that are relevant to the organism and population level. So effects on fecundity in the F1 or F2 are going to potentially affect population persistence over the long term. And I think a lot of, a lot of um, evaluations are considering that right now. And also to think about how abiotic factors influence chemical properties and how that influence then translate up through all of these um, all of these levels of biological organization. So you know, if you're thinking about adverse outcome pathways for modern time it gets a little bit more complicated and again other other speakers have, have alluded to this. Um, but factoring in omics is is of course more complicated and our approach has been to think about developing predictive tools based on functional responses, based on these groupings, like I showed earlier, of genes that either belong to the same pathway or that produce similar biological responses. Um, for example, we saw that in all cases for our multi-generational work, that the WINT pathway was affected um, by each of those chemicals. And that's a pathway that is involved in embryonic development. Um, and so we're starting to think, step back and think a bit about how we could use really clear functional responses like that one that seem to clearly link to a higher level effect to predict what responses we may see based on um, DNA, DNA methylation results. So Again, so many pollutants in so little time, and so really most groups are now moving to high throughput testing um, using adaptive fish early life stage toxicity testing. Um, this has been something that's been in place for many years for freshwater species. Um, we're moving to add Nidia verulina um, as a species available for high throughput toxicity testing, um, and are developing um, well plate assays that can be done in glass well plates. Um, to avoid exposure, to avoid the problem of hydrophobic chemical binding to plastic wells, to avoid the use, the use of plastic, which may interfere with, um, with chemical exposure. Um, and then also moving towards um, assays that assess development, such as um, moldus ethovision, which there is a video here if I can get it to play. There we go. Yeah, so just common, trying to adapt common approaches that have been used 
for years for zebrafish and other freshwater species. So we can get at all of these potential combinations, combinations of stressors and, and really try to make um, responses, measurement of responses as relevant as possible to current day conditions um, in estuaries and along the coast. Um, so with that, um, I'm happy to take questions. I think I think I have a few minutes for that. Um, and thank you again for the invitation to talk today. Great. Thanks for a great talk, Suzanne. We have a few minutes for questions. Just a reminder that uh, you can email questions to talks at sfbi.org. Uh, but I think we have maybe a couple questions from SFBI staff while we wait for other listeners to email in. Sure. Um, Suzanne, this is Melissa. Um, I was just curious um, if you, I mean, sort of looking forward and as, as this type of testing develops, mm -hmm. like, do you think that there will ever be enough certainty at the, the level of a genomic response for regulation to move to that level instead of at that population level? I, I do think we're moving in that direction, um, especially given the other the other talks today, such you know the development of the EcoTop trip is a huge step forward um, to have that available for so many different um, relevant species. So I, I do think we're getting there, but there's always the risk I think of uh, assuming we know more than we do before we know it, and it's it's difficult because funding is limited and time is limited and and even um, with with silver sides, we're trying to limit the number of, of organisms that we need to use, and we're starting to try to develop cell lines and and other predictive tools so we can do tiered testing rather than doing a full um, full suite of testing um, for every chemical. Um, but but I do think we'll get there, and I think we're we're closer um, than than we've ever been. And then. Just a follow up. So, how transferable are the results to other other organisms? Like, is it sort of like within the genus that you you know be willing to sort of transfer those results, or is it at the family level or order? You know, do you know like what's that sort of transferability of the test? Sure, sure. I I think you could use it to predict responses in other urohaline fishes. Um, I, I mentioned earlier in the talk that silver sides are used nationwide as a whole effluent toxicity testing species. So they're already in use widely to assess responses at, at a larger scale. So, uh, but as far as how similar responses would be between fish species, you would really need to assess them, at least a few of them from different states, you know, Family side by side to see how similarly they were responding. So we're, we are currently doing that with um, silver sides and delta smelt, um, and a project we have with the Conan Lab right now. Hopefully, we'll have some more information on that soon. Great. Uh, great. So I haven't received any other questions from audience members. Just a reminder. You can email talks at sfbi.org, um, but we will give our next presenter a couple minutes to come online, and then uh, hopefully he will be here soon. All right, so um, our next presenter is Tim Malloy from the UCLA School of Law. His uh, presentation is going to be more focused on the regulatory side of using predictive toxicology. Um, Tim, can you say something so we know we can hear you? Uh, I'm here. Great, perfect. Thank you so much. You can go ahead and present whenever you're ready. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank you for inviting me uh, to participate. And really, um, thank you to the prior presenters and the presenters to come. I've always thought that the science is way more interesting uh, than the law, and today has been no exception to that. I've learned an awful lot. Um, so it's just been a terrific webinar so far. Um, 
My uh, talk is going to be about the more of the regulatory um, aspects of what we've been calling predictive toxicology. Over the next 20 minutes or so, um, I wanted to do focus on four things. So first, just kind of as a lawyer, we like to get our definitions down. So I want to talk a little bit about the, you know, what it is that we mean when we say predictive toxicology and also kind of clarify some of the other terms that in the legal world and also in the science world have been um, floating around a bit. Then I want to turn to kind of framing the use of predictive toxicology in terms of risk context. That is, you know, uh, what is actually the purpose for which uh, these methodologies would be used? And you've heard that talked about through all the various presentations thus far. People have talked about screening. They've talked about prioritization. Uh, some folks have talked about risk assessment. And I just wanted to kind of get those um, concepts and notions down and use that as a framing mechanism for speaking about some of the legal issues. Then I'll turn to talking about the role that law and related uh, concepts have on the adoption uh, of predictive toxicology in the regulatory setting, as well as constraints. And then lastly, I'll finish out by talking about um, other factors, uh, social and institutional and cultural factors that may affect the uptake of predictive toxicology in a regulatory setting. So that's what uh, I have on store. For you, and let's get started by talking about um, the names that we use. So, uh, predictive toxicology is kind of an umbrella term. I mean, in a certain degree, one could say that all toxicology is predictive, right? Because even when we're engaging in kind of conventional animal based uh, approaches, we're really trying to predict kind of uh, outcomes that we can't actually observe in the population until it's too late, right? So we're still trying to draw inferences from these observational studies that are done. And as some of the presenters already talked about, we tend to call predictive toxicology this uh, kind of, in some ways, newly emerging, in some ways, really uh, rooted in history, approach to making these judgments regarding hazard, exposure, and risk um, through the use of methods that don't involve or minimize the use of uh, conventional animal testing. Um, in the last few years, you may have seen the term alternative testing strategies, or sometimes it's alternative testing strategies and methods. I'll call it ATS um, during my talk today. And I think what's nice about this term is that it recognizes that uh, predictive toxicology isn't all about one kind of new test. Right. So uh, and I think the talks folks have given so far today illustrate this point. Um, uh, computational biology, big data, uh, genomics, they've all opened up new windows such that now we can have particular tests that uh, look at changes at the molecular level. Right. And we can do lots of them uh, in a high throughput setting. And then we can use that data to draw some inferences about what the effects have been. Uh, so those are certain methods that can be used, but also those methods themselves can be layered into kind of more iterative strategies, right, that lead to uh, perhaps more uh, useful decision making and prioritization. So ATS is just one term that kind of expresses this notion that uh, we shouldn't think about individual methodologies on their own, but rather how they can be integrated and can complement one another so as to increase the power uh, for the decision maker ultimately. And then more recently, uh, and this one is particularly important at the federal level under the Toxic Substances Control Act, but it's a, a term that's, um, I would say in the last few years has uh, started to uh, uh, one might say, eclipse the notion of predictive tox and even ATS. And this is a uh, uh, new approach methodology. So generally speaking, new approach methodologies would include any technology, methodology, strategy, or combination of those that could be used to provide information on a chemical hazard or in a risk assessment uh, while avoiding the use of um, animals or 
in some folks' minds, use of intact animals, right? So a new approach methodology might still include the use of uh, some type of animal product, but we wouldn't be, it would not include kind of your conventional two-year cancer bioassay, for example. Um, I'll be using these terms interchangeably, although there are kind of nuances in them and also kind of a reflection of the development of the, the field over time. Um, uh, so let's talk a little bit about the notion of risk context or uh, the uh, ways in which some of these uh, methods, the different uses to which these methods might uh, be put to. Uh, before I go there, just kind of add a little bit of uh, flesh to the bones of this, um, the name game. Um, as I talk today, uh, most of the NAMs, uh, new approach methodologies I'll be referencing, are ones you've heard about so far. So high throughput in vitro screening or HTS, um, folks have talked about, and that's perhaps most po prominent in the ToxCast program. Uh, another approach that we haven't talked about as much, although there's been some reference to it, is uh, what's known as in silico modeling. So this would be uh, using essentially mathematical and data analytics um, instead of actually per perhaps testing or developing screening. Um, this would use really be based on the notion that similar structures, similar characteristics of chemicals can lead us to be able to draw inferences across those chemicals. So in silico modeling um, has kind of its beginning in less sophisticated approaches. So read across methods that would look for uh, functional or structural similarities across um, an chemical analogs, right, from which we could draw an inference that similar structures, uh, similar functional groups might give rise to uh, similar, similar toxicological effects. As uh, this got more and more sophisticated, simple read across methods uh, kind of evolved also into qualitative uh, structure activity relationships, uh, or what might be called SARS. And then ultimately we're now seeing in the world of big data and computational biology, um, taking the effect of uh, very sophisticated quantitative structure activity relationships. Um, so in silico modeling would be a second one of these NAMs. And then I, I would also include in this kind of non-traditional in vivo testing. And I think a good example of this would be kind of the increasingly widespread use of, uh, for example, the C. elegans, so that, that transparent worm. Um, that can be used for, for testing with respect to developmental and reproductive uh, types of toxicology. Um, so the notion of a NAM is actually a very broad uh, concept, and oftentimes the results from these different types of modeling will be either kind of systematically drawn together through some type of integrated testing, or they might be considered together through some form of weight of evidence analysis. Okay, but I had promised you we were going to move on and talk about uh, risk context. Uh, risk context is just kind of a term that was used in the National Academy uh, report on predictive toxicology back in the uh, late 2000s. Uh, really, all it means is uh, what was the purpose to which you're going to put these methodologies? So uh, there's four that I tend to think about. Um, People could uh, kind of organize these in a slightly different way, but I think this captures most of the major uses. So the first would be uh, that we use these methodologies to kind of screen uh, chemicals or other substances. And screening itself is sort of a broad term. Um, it could include and often includes what I call first pass evaluation in which a decision maker is trying to, you know, look through a large number of chemicals in order to identify those that should be held over for more, perhaps more expensive uh, evaluation in the form of testing. But uh, screening could also be kind of embedded into a test uh, protocol itself, right? So what I call enhanced screening, in which uh, the, uh, the NAM is part of a tiered testing or integrated testing strategy. So the results of one test or a set of tests would then prescribe or influence what the next level of testing could would be. So this is more of a self-contained uh, notion of screening. Uh, the next related to screening would be ranking and prioritization, right? So we're gonna use the results from our, uh, 
our NAM, our alternative testing strategy, essentially to to scale relative, create a relative ranking or scale of chemicals based upon one or more criteria that are important to the decision maker, right? So notice, like with ranking and prioritization, the uh, kind of specificity of your uh, measurement um, does not have to be as uh, precise as one would think, say, for risk assessment, right? Because we're only trying at this point to get a relative sense of the uh, impacts or the potency of a particular chemical or material. Uh, the next uh, kind of risk context in which we might use these things would be to actually predict toxicology, the toxicity of a material in risk assessment, and uh, and to ultimately use those results in developing risk management approaches. So um, now when I talk about risk assessment here, I certainly include the notion of, you know, the quantitative risk assessment that many people are, are familiar with, you know, four steps of risk assessment, uh, including dose response. Um, and that requires a fairly high level of, or a very high level of uh, data in order to perform it. But uh, risk assessment and risk management can also include uh, less sophisticated qualitative approaches. And in fact, in many cases, um, we will find those kinds of uh, qualitative approaches used both in a regulatory setting. So for this, you might think about um, EPA's uh, new chemical review program under TSCA um, or within um, uh, industry settings. So, for example, if one thinks about industrial hygiene and how judgments are made about risk and risk management there, uh, in industrial hygiene, typically a, a qualitative control banding approach is used. But that still counts as risk assessment, risk management. And NAMs uh, would still be quite relevant uh, in that setting. In fact, they may even be more useful in that setting than in a quantitative uh, risk assessment. And then the last risk context would be safer design, safer alternative selection. Uh, some folks might call this comparative assessment. In California, we know it is alternative analysis. In the European Union, under the REACH program, uh, it's called analysis of alternatives. The idea here is that uh, the comparative assessment is trying to identify and then evaluate potentially viable, safer alternatives to an incumbent chemical or process. All right, so we have then those four uh, uh, risk contexts that, in which it might be used. So keep them in mind because we'll talk a little bit about them later on when we talk about the role of law uh, in either encouraging or requiring the use of NAMs. Uh, before I get to that, just a word about uh, integration of NAMs into regulatory settings. Um, obviously, um, there's many different types of uh, regulatory settings where they may be relevant. Uh, we've heard about a few of them today, so I won't get into quite as much detail on that, but I just wanted to make a couple points about it. So um, integration currently uh, is happening kind of in two broad ways, right? Uh, the first way is building the use of NAMs into regulatory actions now. So for example, in the European Union, uh, under the REACH chemical regulation, um, that program actually calls for uh, kind of a uh, has a preference for the use of non-animal testing uh, in the registration of chemicals. So under the, the REACH program, uh, chemicals that are being marketed in the European Union need to be registered. And there is kind of a minimum data set that is required for each of them. And in order to generate that data set, the registrants are uh, required to use alternatives to animal testing where they're available. And you see ECHA, which is the environmental agency in the EU, is issuing guidance that actually, um, you know, provides, uh, well, for want of a better word, guidance to the registrants in terms of how to implement the use of NAMs in that setting. Um, there's other examples of this uh, elsewhere uh, in the U.S. Um, as well. Uh, so that's one type of approach, right, where we're seeing the regulation uh, actually making use of NAMS currently. The other kind of large scale inter integration efforts that you see are strategic planning, road mapping, that sort of stuff. 
where the agencies are trying to roll out a systematic way to incorporate the use of NAMs. Uh, perhaps not so much today, but thinking about what will be necessary in order to reach uh, a point over time where we're, we find that uh, NAMs are a more uh, substantial, plays a substantial role. All right, so with that background in mind, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the relationship of uh, law uh, and law-related issues to the adoption of ATS. So um, this is a conceptual framework that we developed um, back in 2016 uh, to help us think about all the different um, drivers related to law that might have a role to play in the scope and the rate of ATS adoption. So let me, uh, let's take a look at each of these factors. So uh, in most settings, formal law, and by that I mean actual statutes and uh, formal regulations that have been promulgated by agencies and have the effect of enforceable law. In most settings, existing law is not a barrier to the use of NAMS. Uh, in fewer settings, but in an increasing number, uh, there's actually affirmative language that encourages or even requires the use of NAMS. Uh, and surprisingly, this language has been in some of these statutes for decades. So kind of the classic example of this is the original Toxic Substances Control Act uh, enacted in 1976. The statute itself explicitly stated that testing of chemicals would include, in addition to the kind of the normal epidemiological studies and observational studies, whole animal tests, also calls for the use of in vitro tests. And the legislative history that supported um, the passage of that uh, statute called for EPA to consider alternative test methods, noting that with the development of reliable non-animal tests for predicting long-term effects of chemicals on health, the need for animal test data uh, should significantly diminish, right? So even back in 1976, the statute was envisioning this move towards NAMS. Now, it took us a bit of time to get there. Uh, TASTA was uh, reauthorized and changed uh, in 2016. And there is now stronger language in the statute calling for the adoption of non-animal testing. And the EPA recently issued uh, <clears throat> a directive that sets out a very ambitious schedule for eliminating mammal, uh, at least mammal studies, um, in the short term. Perhaps too ambitious, um, but it's an indication that the formal law, at least in that setting, is driving, uh, can be driving NAM use. I mentioned already the European Union's REACH program, which requires registrations to uh, prioritize non-animal uh, testing. Also, under the REACH uh, uh, program, uh, for chemicals of high concern um, for a limited number of these materials, Manufacturers are required to perform an, an analysis of alternatives, and the guidance documents uh, for that program also encourage the use of uh, these in silico methods or QSARs that I spoke about before. Uh, we recently con continue, uh, completed a study of uh, alternative analysis uh, applications that were submitted in the EU uh, up through 2017. And it turns out that there is, uh, while there is some use of QSARs uh, in those applications, it's fairly minimal. So the law encourages it in that case, but the uptake of it um, doesn't appear to be particularly significant. Okay, so that's formal law, uh, but things other than the statute and the regulations can affect this. Uh, before I go on, just one more thing I'd like to mention. In California, the Safer Consumer Products um, statute also requires uh, certain manufacturers to engage in an alternative analysis of their products to see if uh, chemicals of concern could be replaced by a safer alternative. Um, and in doing that analysis, the statute requires the manufacturer to identify hazard traits of concern in the chemical and then to uh, compare those to alternatives to see if the hazards might be reduced. The interesting thing about this program that is uh, there's a uh, set of regulations that identify what the relevant hazard traits might be. Um, 
and it incorporates the notion of NAMs in some very interesting ways. The first less surprising way is that with respect to uh, things like carcinogenicity or other uh, other uh, kind of uh, well-known um, toxic endpoints, uh, the regulations uh, specifically identify in vitro assays, uh, mechanistic studies, and uh, uh, some in silico modeling as relevant tools to be used to identify whether the hazard trait is present and the you know, the extent to which the material presents that hazard. Uh, but the really innovative aspect of these regulations is that, um, as you see here, as I've displayed on the screen, uh, reactivity and biological systems itself is identified as a hazard trait, right? So here we're not necessarily looking at specific uh, health outcomes as much as we are looking at uh, mechanisms that may lead to adverse health incomes. Uh, unclear right now what kind of impact that will have actually on in this program as alternative analyses kind of start to roll out because we haven't seen any alternative analyses that have included this hazard trait and there's some other hazard traits that have kind of a, a similar approach. Uh, but something to keep our eye on in terms of, of uh, the integration of NAMs into our regulatory structure. Let's look at some of these other factors. So court interpretation. The uh, interesting thing here is that courts rarely play a role uh, with respect to NAMs. There's only been two instances of which I'm aware where uh, a regulatory agency has used the NAM and it's been challenged. Both of them occurred uh, in the TSCA setting, challenges to EPA testing requirements. And in both cases, the federal court supported the agency's reliance on alternative testing strategies, noting that such methodologies are very important in uh where there are conditions of uncertainty because of lack of data and lack of existing information. So thus far, the courts have been very supportive of this. Uh, risk context uh, also plays an important role in the rate of ATS adoption. I'm going to show you a study that, um, a survey that we completed back in 2016 or 2015 uh, that talks a little bit in more detail about this, but as a kind of a basic uh, notion here. Uh, we tend to see more uptake of NAMs at the screening and ranking uh, in the screening and ranking uses. And as you might expect, a slower move towards its use in risk assessment, although the survey did provide some interesting information about the use of NAMs in risk assessment in the private sector. And then lastly, uh, informal practice by the agencies can have a great uh, impact on the scope and rate of ATS adoption. So, for example, under the old TOSCA program, EPA leveraged its experience in seeing uh, analogs for individual chemicals uh, and developed a whole set of chemical categories. So, essentially, a systematic use of uh, structure activity relationship. And they would use these chemical categories to identify relevant testing that would be required for new chemicals that were submitted. Uh, and also, EPA made fairly broad use of alternative testing in the form of in vitro, mechanistic in vitro uh, testing. Between 1984 and 2016, EPA promulgated 23 test rules uh, promulgated upon a finding of a potential for unreasonable risk of the, the uh, chemical. And uh, EPA explicitly relied upon in vitro test data and structure activity relationships uh, to support unreasonable risk finding is more than half those rules. So predictive toxicology, or at least it's uh, kind of historical antecedents have been with us for quite some time. Okay, so um, I would now just want to uh, use my last few uh, slides to talk just a bit about uh, what we think may be going on uh, in the real world. So. Uh, in 2015, uh, we put together a survey. Our, our goal was to look at the use, the viability, or the perceived viability by folks in the field uh, of different NAMs. Uh, we wanted to get their perception of what the barriers were and what the drivers were. We started out with some elite interviews from toxicologists and other experts, about 25 folks that we interviewed first. And we used those results to generate a uh, survey that was disseminated through a variety of societies. And we ended up with about uh, 1,300 uh, respondents. Just to give you a sense of who these folks were, this is just by position. 
Um, so over half of them were toxicologists, and you can see the spread across these others. Uh, and they were from a variety of sectors, right? So academics, um, they were from industry, they were from government, uh, from the NGO sector, right? So broadly uh, spaced out. So uh, first thing we wanted, we asked them about was what they saw as the socio-legal barriers to uh, the adoption of NAMS. And, you know, um, before this, we did this survey uh, in the literature, there's quite a bit of talk about the legal barriers to adoption. But turns out, uh, consistent with what I've just talked about, legal challenges to uh, uh, the ability to use NAMS and then the results of those NAMS really didn't, weren't much of a concern across a full range of uh, NAMs that I list at the bottom of the slide there, right? In fact, it turned out that really there were concerns about regulatory acceptance kind of led the, the path there. Uh, scientifically, um, culturally based concerns about lack of standardization and also the notion that there's a slow validation process. Now, some folks have talked about validation a bit before. When I talk about validation, I'm talking about more uh, 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 systematic requirements for the use of validation before a regulatory agency will approve its use. So it essentially requires an objective demonstration that the, the test method or strategy actually measures the attribute in a reliable manner. So here we're not only talking about the reliability of the assay, but also its fitness for that particular purpose, its reproducibility, and also a demonstration of its accuracy, right? So for years, and even today, I would say there's been some uncertainty about what validation looks like for these new approach methodologies. Um, and uh, there is a bit of a controversy now whether it's really appropriate to, in terms of uh, the accuracy of these new approaches, to compare them to uh, animal studies, you know, um, conventional protocols for animal studies, which themselves really had never been validated. Right. So there is some issue about the validation process. There's been move in that movement in that in the U.S. There is a coordinating committee on the validation of alternative methods that acts as kind of an interagency uh, working group that uh, will move through and validate uh, testing methods, which then can be picked up by rel uh, relevant regulatory agencies in the U.S. And that uh, ICFAM, as it's known, has uh, moved over the last, say, eight to 10 years to really attempt to accelerate that process and also to bring the agencies in earlier and uh, start to try to lead to the validation of uh, tests that are really relevant to where the agency finds itself moving. Um, and of course, there's always resistance to change. Um, so let's, uh, being a little more optimistic at this point, let's look at the drivers of adoption. Uh, the leading ones were, you know, perceived need for toxicological data, uh, a, a desire to reduce the testing costs, as one of the other uh, presenters talked about, and of course, ethical concerns. Um, there was not a sense among the users of these that demand by consumers or that industry on its own because of a desire to uh, reduce its testing costs or even demands widespread demands by NGOs for the adoption of the testing. Really, uh, the drivers were going to be the three that I noted. And then also the, the participants noted that demand by regulatory agencies was really one of the driving forces here. And as I mentioned before, uh, we are starting to see some movement in that direction in terms of changes to formal law and uh, efforts by agencies to produce guidance to implement that and then also to build roadmaps. Uh, that would essentially uh, lead the way towards greater use of NAMS. And with that, I'll take any questions if there are any. So uh, we have not received any email questions, but feel free to email. Um, in the interest of time, I think that we'll go ahead and move on to Alvina's talk. Um, but thank you so much, Tim, for a great look into the regulatory uh, legal aspects of using uh, using predictive toxicology methods. So um, our last presenter is Alvina, um, who, who is uh, from the Southern California.
Southern California Coastal Water Research Project, SCORP, which is um, SFEI's sort of sister agency in Southern California. Um, and she is going to talk about um, how SCORP's regional monitoring program uh, has been using predictive toxicology methods. So um, I'm going to go ahead then. Uh, hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, if you remember the very first presentation, that's essentially what, what I'm going to cover, the cell bioassays, but also how we can use those for the purpose of environmental monitoring. And uh, I did want to acknowledge um, my collaborators, academic partner, and some of the research program we've been collaborating with to apply uh, those tools. Next slide. All right. So if you think about CCs, one of the pictures that came up in, in the several presentations was this iceberg. There is um, a lot of chemicals out there, and currently for monitoring because of finance and, and time and just for logistic purposes, we cannot measure everything. So we focus on a small portion of chemicals with the assumption that we already know what's of concern. And there's no mechanism right now to address the unexpected chemicals. We started with DDTs a very long time ago. If you click um, again to this animation, click on the PowerPoint. Piece. Yeah, uh, pyrethroids was more recently um, one of the chemicals of concern. And if you click again, you'll see that now PFAS is a chemical that we worried about. We we heard uh, briefly earlier about microplastics, so there's a few more, and I'm sure there's going to be more chemicals coming on within the few months, possibly or, or years. The rest, the bottom line is that we don't have a good mechanism right now to look or really predict what is the next chemical of concern. We have this very defined list, and when we look at the chemistry and compare that to toxicity, often the two don't match very well. One of the reasons is because relevant toxicity data is limited. The big concern really is mixture effects. And if we continue to look at chemicals one by one and try to predict their effects, what it will give what this will give us some element of response. It may not match what we see in environments where organisms are dealing with mixtures. And so doing the current approach can be difficult and um, it makes the establishment of monitoring threshold quite challenging. So in the next slide, CORAP has been working with um, different partners and experts to develop a framework that combines existing tools like targeted chemistry, lab toxicity tests, or some field survey with new, new tools like biological cell assay or non-targeted chemistry. The goal of this new framework is to supplement what's currently being done and the chemical by chemical monitoring was improving understanding of mixture toxicity. This framework has been endorsed by the state. And essentially what I wanted to focus on is to look at the arrow that points towards the targeted chemistry. With this, what we're trying to do with cell bioassay as a tier one, is a way to address the question of which chemicals are um, of concern and which one should be prioritized. So the big things and the big difference in the framework here is that we don't start with a list of contaminants that we believe are of concern. We extract the whole sample, do biological screening, which is a rapid tool, and then based on this data, we will then decide what are the chemicals that should be of concern. And if we go on the, the other arrow that points to the lab toxicity test, these type of assays can also help us identifying what are the likely toxicity pathways and outcomes that we should be worried about. So while this is different construct, what I'm talking about should be very familiar to what Dan spoke of uh, earlier this morning about the tools that are developed by the EPA and used um, to address toxicity. Next slide. Why cell bioassays? Because they're rapid screening tools, they're cost effective, and they can screen for multiple contaminants, thus allowing us to get a better understanding of the mixture. Those assays are engineered to represent key biological pathways, and therefore there's the potential there to link to an adverse effect. But it also helps improve on the exposure side by providing a combined measure of all the chemicals that have the same bioactivity. 
One thing that I always like to point out is that the tools may be new to us in the environmental field, and even, I mean, when I say new, I think it's been around for at least 15, 20 years. Um, but it's been used even much longer, for a much longer period of time in the pharmaceutical, cosmetic, and food industry. And you also heard earlier of one of the examples um, that Dan presented with the Top 21 and Top Tax program, where EPA is also using it for chemical registration. The big thing is that those companies, or um, uh, not companies, but these sectors, are using these tools to screen for individual contaminants. And I will repeat that several times throughout the presentation. Here we are dealing with mixtures, and to help us really move those tools from the lab and bench um, type assay to the environment, we wanted to keep that complexity in the way we assess um, the, the use of the assay. Next slide. So briefly, um, I won't go so much on how you do it. I just wanted to uh, discuss some of the key elements of the cell bioassays that we are using at Square. We're using the million cell life. Um, you may wonder why it's so looking about ecological health. The reason for that is, as you've heard several times, there's so many species that may be at risk, some may be very unique to an environment. Uh, it can be very difficult to identify what is the right cell line, what is the right animal model. So what we've decided to now is to use available technology, commercially available assays that we treat, and most of them tend to be mammalian, um, so human cell line or mice. And our goal is to see, can we use just the standard assays that have been tested and used in different industries and adapt them to environmental, for environmental purposes. The other component I want to point out is that these assays are based on light emission, with the light intensity being proportional to the concentration of bioactive contaminants. So that helps address the mixture exposure side. And the results are expressed as an equivalent concentration. So the result, even though it's a bioassay, we're not talking about presence versus absence of light or um, live or dead. We can actually quantify this response and relate that to a known chemical, which makes it quite powerful when we want to explain those results, especially on the chemistry. Next slide. Here is the list of candidate bioassays that we're currently working on. We select those based on two criteria. First, the associated toxicity. What, so what is the um, pathways that those bioassays inform? And what is the likely adverse outcome that could be associated with, the, with those um, bioactivities? And the second component is what are the known chemical classes of compounds that could trigger that response. So we may not go to the level of nanophenol or pyrethroid A, B, or C, you know, by country or something like that. But we look at overall type of chemicals that could activate those receptors. Next slide. Ultimately, our bigger goal is to develop a set of bioassays. And this is just an example of assays that we're considering. We have about 10 of them right now. And our goal is to develop a comprehensive list of assays that meet several criteria that are widely available so that it's not, we're not rely, relying on one source to use those tools that have the best protocol with performance-based criteria, and that's very important for us. A lot of assays out there can be used without any guidance of what's good or bad data, and so from a management standpoint and application for non-experts, that can be very tricky. And we want to make sure that those tools are consistent with monitoring goals and also have associated monitoring trigger level or threshold. Okay. So to address the last two part of the of the previous slide, we have several we have two key questions. The first one is what is the what are the key I don't know what oh my, what is the sensitivity of cell bioassays specifically in when we use those on real field samples? And in other words, can we discriminate between uh, different levels of contamination in the sample? The second question we have is do the bioactivity patterns make sense? And in other words, we wanted to find out whether or not we can explain those results based on other line of evidence, including chemistry and toxicity data. Okay. 
So our approach has been to collect a variety of samples. We focused a lot on aqueous matrices, wastewater, influent effluent, ambient waters, advanced treated water, and also uh, we're starting to move into sediment and space tissue. A lot of the work I'm going to present today is on three bioassays. This ER alpha that screens for estrogen, HR that's a more broad, um, has a broader application and looks at um, dioxin-like compounds of THs, GCDs, and GR bioassays that look for a class of pharmaceuticals called glucocorticoids. Every time we run those assays, our goal was to compare them with other line of evidence, so whether we had targeted or non-targeted chemistry data, lab toxicity data, or even field benthic uh, indices that we could compare this to. Okay. All right. So the first study, uh, set of study I want to talk about is uh, we applied those tools on estrogen impacted estrogen impacted rivers. We sampled eight wastewater treatment plants and about 30 different sites in the vicinity waters throughout California. And the big picture I wanted to point out here is that we did see a difference in bioactivity, whether we use ER or the GR bioassay, depending on the environment that we were testing. And those patterns should not make any, should not be of any surprise for you. Improvement at the highest level of bioactivity, Secondary versus tertiary effluent, we also saw a difference there. And in the ambient environment, most of our samples were below the detection limit, and we only had very few of them that had above detection limit concentration. So the, if you click there, the conclusion is that the bioactivity patterns make sense, and they reflected the level of treatment and also concurred with the available water quality data. Another set of studies that we've conducted was to understand the promise of this tool, but also how reproducible are these uh, assays when we use them, when we compare by, uh, to different labs. So we participated in several inter-comparison inter exercises. We usually send samples as blind uh, samples that water extract, so we try to remove the bias of extraction. It's the same sample uh, extract that's split and sent to different labs. The labs have different levels of expertise, and they were allowed to use two different commercial assays. Ultimately, all the data was evaluated in one place, and um, based on a set of defined QA criteria like calibration, blank samples, size of toxicity, and things like that. So the different dots that you see here are the different labs that tested those samples. And again, that was very promising because in doing those studies, we found that we have an agreement when a sample is clean or there's nothing there that we can detect uh, using conventional chemistry, like the field blank as the final product filter. The bioactivity response is also at or below detection um, limit. In samples like the tertiary effluent or after microfiltration, however, we did see some bioactivity. There is a difference in the actual uh, quantification. You see some had quantification for the uh, estimate of about six nanograms, others at about eight. So there's clearly some improvement there that's needed. But overall, there is a clear pattern and difference between those two samples, the estimate and the micro filtrate. And this was consistent throughout the different labs. Next. More recently, we've also tried to test those on coastal and marine um, sediments. Some of you may be familiar with the BITE. Uh, this is a regional survey conducted every five years in Southern California. SPARC is one of the agencies that helped uh, organize the, this, um, this big survey. And there's, I don't know, maybe, so I don't have the exact number. There's many agencies here that all pull their resource together to collect over 500 different samples, sediment, water, benthic communities, some samples for ocean acidification, hydrotoxins. So as you can imagine, it's a lot of effort to collect all the samples, but also a lot of effort to analyze everything. So one of the uh, questions we had is, could we use cell bioassays here to help prioritizing the sites where we want to invest in those uh, time-consuming and more expensive types of analysis? So what I have here is a map of the samples that we collected. We did not analyze everything. We analyzed about 60 or so samples. 
some different habitats, estuaries, the mid shelves, the marinas, the ports, and the Channel Islands. We do have an hypothesis starting in this study that the Channel Islands, which is a protected area, would have very low levels of um, bioactive contaminants, while areas like the estuaries or the ports would have much higher levels, and therefore this is where people should really be investing their time in doing more analysis. So I'm going to show you some of the results. The, the big goal was to evaluate the extent and magnitude of the bioscreening response. And what you see to the right is just the proportion of hits. So instead of giving you concentrations here, what I wanted to show you is for each category, the number of sites that we, uh, number of samples that we analyzed. And the big picture is that, again, the results um, were supported by our hypothesis. Sorry, the results supported our hypothesis. The Channel Island had mostly no bioactivity. There was only one site that had quantifiable levels, and those were very low. However, on the other side, which was estuaries and marina, we had much higher, uh, a variety of response, but overall, the highest level that we found were in the estuaries and the marina. What was interesting in the port as well is that uh, we had only three sites that had a hit, but those were all in the same port. So again, if we consider that we would be measuring uh, collecting samples in 20 or 30 different ports with these assays, at least based on this initial data, it suggested that one of these ports specifically uh, was worth um, more investigation. We also wanted to compare those with other lines of evidence. The first one was looking at exposure and the different types of contaminants. As part of the bite, the different labs are measuring PAHs. And what I did here is compare the total pHs to the bioactivity. And if you click there, I want to focus on two different zones. Yes, thank you. The blue side, uh, what I wanted to point out here is that a lot of the samples that had very low uh, bioactivity also had fairly well, the lo lower amount of total pHs. And on the other end, some of the highest level of bioactivity also had the highest amount of pHs. As you can see, it's not perfect. We do have some sites where there's a lot of pHs there and not as many, uh, not as much bioactivity. We've not investigated those. We did, um, when I'm comparing these data, I want to point out that these were done by different labs, different extraction procedures. So there is a possibility there that some of um, those um, discrepancy could be explained by that. But Given that we're only focusing on pHs, it could be other chemicals that are either suppressing the bioactivity in that assay or other reasons. So in the next couple of months, we will try to investigate why we don't have a nice, perfect line. But at least for now, from this just simple purpose of prioritizing, we're seeing that for the most part, if something is low in bioactivity, we don't have a lot of those bioactive contaminants that should be, um, that explain that response. The next set of um, data that we compared to was for toxicity. And before I go through this graph, I did want to point out that cell bioassays looks at very early warning, just an activation of the receptor. So that's a sublethal, very sensitive endpoint. We compared this to an antipod assay, which uh, looked at survival after um, seven days, I believe. And um, this is not the optimal, uh, this is not the best comparison because we are looking at two different test um, endpoints and two different types of sensitivity. But again, from just a prioritization standpoint, I wanted to show you this. So, Agreement with toxicity is not as good as the one with, with chemistry, but there's still some lessons learned there. Amongst the non-toxic samples, there were about 50 of those that didn't have any uh, toxicity and also had very low bioactivity. However, when you look at the higher level of antifog toxicity, those also coincided with some of the samples that we found high AHR bioactivity. So, this test in our framework as a tier one could definitely be used there to help guide from the testing. However, it's clear, especially when you look at some of the higher level bioactivity in the non-toxic category, it's clear that there's more work to, to be done to make sure that in using this method, we don't end up missing sites where we could have some impact with our first. 
Next slide. So this leads to one um, important question, which is uh, the focus of the the, set, the webinar today. What is the link between cell bioactivity and aquatic health? This is an area of ongoing research globally. You have a lot of the presentation addressed that today. And what's really key in uh, the approach that we're all using is that if we can understand the simple relationship between biological events from the cell level to the organism level, that can help us in several ways. It can help us reduce the number of animals that are tested. Uh, Michelle talked about that earlier. It can help us be more protective and predictive of toxicity. And in the case of our framework, that would help us develop those relevant trigger values that are protective of the public health. So, next. Thank you. So, we are using the adverse outcome uh, pathway concept, uh, concept that you heard earlier this morning. We're not developing AOPs, we're using what's available in the literature, and we are applying our own tools based on that context and in this cascade of events to see if those relationships are um, still valid when we use our assays. The, the big difference in the way we're using the AOP concept is that our interest is using cell-based mammalian, um, mammalian cell-based screening assays to capture this initial or one of the early molecular events. And we want to understand the sensitivity of those and compare those to the sensitivity of an animal test, looking at different endpoints within those tests, whether they're already in regulation or they're more investigated. So we look at genes, proteins, tissue damage, but also typical endpoints like reproduction, survival, and growth. Next. All right. So I'm going to talk about one example of uh, using the, some of the estrogenic um, AOP because those are fairly well defined. Um, over the years, we've conducted exposures in different environments, lab-based experiments using single chemicals or effluent dilution. We also did some field-based studies in some of those effluent impacted river systems that we have in Southern California. We've used different biological models, the fat head mino, the manidia cervicide, and uh, we're also using, for, for a lot of the work we've been doing right now, is the gene laser platform, which is one of the available assays for, um, for bioscreening. Our endpoints, we look at chemical concentration and bioactivity in the water, gene and protein, as well as tissue damage, development, reproduction, and so on. So I'm going to show you two sets of results. The first one is for the media. We worked on um, this study with um, University of Florida, and this was partially funded by the RMT, actually. This was a 28-day uh, exposure. We exposed the organism to two different chemicals, uh, to several chemicals, and I'm going to present two of them today. If you click on that. Yes. So today I'm going to talk about est estradiol and estron. And what you see here is for each category, the bioactivity, the gene expression, the gonadal change, and the reduced growth, I'm reporting the lowest observed effect concentration. So for the cell bioassay, we use EC10, so 10% of the bioactivity response, the maximum response, and that was about 8 nanograms for estradiol. Um, so for this test, I do want to point out that we did different concentrations. So we didn't test everything between 8 and 200. We had about two different concentrations between those. But the most sensitive in that test at 200 nanograms is when we started to see changes at the gene expression level. And that's also when we started to see um, changes at the gonadal uh, tissue level. We did not see anything on the growth. So that's why we, we I have this as greater than 500 nanograms. For s it's pretty much the same relationship. And the key message here is that when we look at the EC10 for the cell bioassays for E2 and E1, those response to terra concentrations that are much lower than the concentration that you see in the animal model in the in the cell. When we expose organisms to excellent dilution that had less than the EC10, so less than five nanograms actually per liter of E2, 
We found no increase in gene expression, no increase in gonadal development, no effect on the The main message here is that the animal response occurred at concentrations that were greater than the cell line cell response, even though I'm comparing a mammalian cell line to a fish model. And so this type of data suggests that we could use a generic cell-based, uh, mammalian-based cell line to be uh, an initial to provide an initial screening for toxicity before we go into then to the more expensive um, animal testing. The second example I'm going to go through uh, to see not to do too much on uh, the time. It was a 21 day exposure of adult fat and minerals. So this uh, test you might be familiar with. It was female fat and minerals are housed in, um, in small cages and we're looking at reproductive um, we looked at estradiol, and again, this is the same um, rationale and the same AOP thinking that, I, that we were using, comparing cell bioassay response to changes at the gene level, um, sexual characteristics, and also overall reproduction. What we found is that the cell bioassay was, um, response occurred at concentrations that were two times lower than the first change that we, see, we saw in the fish. So, EC10 for the cell bioassay is 8. The, earth, the, the lowest concentration at which we saw gene expression changes is 18 nanograms, and it took 10 times more, 180 nanograms, to find some effect at the reproductive level. And once again, we tested those in comparison to receiving water, and we found no effect. So that's another added line of evidence that suggested those tools could be useful to reduce animal testing and predict where we have an Next. Yeah, that's okay. Next. All right, so what have we learned? We learned that adapting cell bioassays for environmental monitoring is possible. We were able to use those in various environments and matrices, and each time um, the, the data, the bioactivity data, did concur with what the underlying data that we had. Most importantly, we've also shown that it doesn't, it's not because one lab has high expertise that they can do that. Uh, if you have standardized protocols and you really follow the QH, I'm sure it's obvious to all of you, the results are reproducible. So it's not just one person that can replicate those. The site based monitoring could streamline existing practices in our um, various studies. We've shown that um, those tools can be used to prioritize the sites that require further testing, but also. There's definitely potential there to help us identify what are the likely outcomes that we have. Right now, we tend to automatically use short-term looking at growth or um, uh, survival. But if we have a concern on anything that's endocrine disrupting, given the low concentration in the environment, this type of test can help us so that we actually do the right biological um, bioassay and look at the right answer. And most importantly, we're also showing that establishing in vitro effect thresholds is possible. Next and last slide. All right. So I, do, I did want to finish by switching gears a little bit and pointing out that cell bioassays are currently being recommended at international level, but also starting to be used for water quality monitoring. The um, the European Union is working on a variety of projects and has made the recommendation that those effects-based monitoring tools are useful for diagnosis and monitoring and also to the task of prioritizing contaminants of emerging concern. In California, a, uh, the State Water Board has recently released an amended policy for recycled water and this is the first application of cell bioassay. Utilities starting next month will be screening recycled water to make sure that beyond the target of chemicals that they're measuring, they're not missing anything else and therefore the, the water is safe to inspect. That's all I have. Sorry with the problem we had earlier, but thanks for sticking around. And I'll take any questions if I have time. All right, thank you, Alvina, for dealing with the technical issues and still giving a great presentation. Um, once again, if you have questions, go ahead and email them to talks at sfei.org. I'm going to take the presentation 
you back. Oh, I'm oh. still presenting. Oh my gosh, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, also thinking about time, um, since we don't have any questions from listeners yet, I'm going to move on to just thanking all of our presenters and then talking about our next steps. So, um, several of the presenters gave their contact information if you want to talk in detail with them, or you can contact us using this talks at sfei.org website. You can contact me, uh, Ezra M, at sfei.org. Some of you may know me as Liz, and that email still works, but this is my preferred email. Um, and then Rebecca Sutton, who is our lead scientist for the Emerging Contaminants Work Group, is Rebecca S. at sfei.org. So you can contact any of us if you have questions. Um, hopefully we will see, or maybe, depending on coronavirus, just hear you at the um, <laughs> next Emerging Contaminants Work Group meeting, which is scheduled for April 23rd and 24th, so hopefully that's on your calendar. Um, and predictive toxicology will be discussed more at that meeting. Um, and we will be getting you uh, the 2020 CEC strategy update as part of that meeting package, um, which will have discussion of predictive toxicology and next steps for using it for risk assessment here in the Bay RMP. Um, so that is all I have. Um, in the absence of questions, I think we will stop here and you all know how to find us. So thank you for attending um, and have a wonderful rest of your day.